All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> um, Mimi, um, are you seeing any uh, public comment and uh, commenters? And if so, I can make an announcement. Yeah, I am seeing. I think they're still populating. Um, so far, we have three, five, four. Do you want to give it a minute? Yeah, let's let's uh, give it a minute, and then uh, I can make a short um, announcement, and then we can take any public comment. Um, but I, I assume, it, or if, if you'd like to take roll first while we wait, okay. To see, um, that that might make sense. All right. Uh, let me just make sure there are no members in the attendees pool. Okay, we're good. All right, uh, we now have a quorum and we'll begin the COPRAC meeting. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. And before I do roll call, we ask that anyone who plans on giving public comments should use the raise hand function to indicate you'd like to do so. Now with permission of the chair, I'll take the roll call. Thanks. Justin Fields. Here. Ken Bacon. Here. Sarah Bonola. Here. Elizabeth Bradley. Here. Cassidy Chivers. Here. Toby Inlander. I see Toby, but she's on mute. Here. Thank you. Brendan Krieger. Here. Joel Mark. Here. Eleanor Mercado. Here. Bill Munoz. Here. And I hope. <clears throat> Sorry, my video is not working for whatever reason. Uh, Dina Roach and Kyla Rowe. Here. And Hunter Starr. And I believe Hunter's out because he is ill. So, all right. Great, thanks. Um, so Mimi, uh, sounds like we do have some public commenters. Is that right? Yes, we have about four. Okay, great. So um, let me just make a brief announcement uh, for those who want to provide public comment. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'll just let you know that if you're here to provide comments on the um, district attorney campaign contribution issue, that that is not an issue on our agenda today and that the committee will not be taking it up. If you still would like to provide public comment, you are of course welcome to do so on that issue or, or any other issue. We have a very uh, jam-packed schedule today. Um, that we need to get through. And so for that reason, we do need to limit public comment uh, to one minute per person. And I would ask that if um, a, a prior commenter says something that you agree with or endorse, you're welcome to let us know that rather than repeating uh, the comment that has previously been made. And so with that, uh, Mimi, I would open the floor to the, the public commenters. So as I said earlier, if you'd like to give public comment, please use the raise hand function. Okay, uh, we'll start with uh, Prosecutors Alliance. You'll have Good one morning. minute. Great. Good morning, committee members. I'll be brief, given the fact that this item is not on your agenda today. I did just want to point out our previous communications to your committee and the trustees on this issue and hope that we can be a resource to you as you're considering the appropriate pathway forward. It is clear from the rules that exist around conflicts of interest that they don't adequately address the issues faced by prosecutors who do not have a named client, but rather represent the state and the county at large. We hope that this will be part of your consideration in identifying more appropriate rules to govern the ethical and challenges and conflicts that face prosecutors in evaluating police misconduct cases. Thank you very much for all you've done on this issue and continue to do. We look forward to working with you on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who would like to give public comment? Please indicate you'd like to do so by raising your hand. Uh, Adrian Carpenter. Adrian, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Yes, um, I just wanted to echo the last comments. I'm Adrian Carpenter representing Prosecutors Alliance. I do believe that district attorneys will undoubtedly review use of force incidents involving police officers 
And when they do, the financial and political support of the association representing the individual under investigation should not be allowed to influence that decision making process. This creates a conflict for the elected prosecutor, but the current rules do not expressly deal with the conflicts of prosecutors who do not have an individual client who can raise the conflict. I thank you for your time on this issue, and I thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to give public comment before we move on with the rest of our agenda? It looks like no one has indicated that he'd like to do so. So we can move Great. on. Great, so we'll close public comment. And I believe next uh, up is the oh, approval of minutes from last meeting, is that right? Um, we can first do announcements if there are any, um, either from the chair or from staff. Uh, I have nothing. Uh, for the staff report, uh, we have been following the issue of the Bagley Keene requirements. I did check in with the staff at the state bar who is closely monitoring that. And there has been no change since we announced at the last meeting that the uh, normal open meeting requirements are scheduled to uh, vert back to the pre-pandemic standards after March 31st. Um, but there is still some possible expectation that that will change. But as it stands today, um, the remote meeting requirements would kick back in after that. That's all I have. Thanks, thanks, Randy. So the next item would be the approval of the open session action summary. Um, if I could get a motion and a second, please. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Justin. I'll second. And, uh, sorry, who was that who made a second? Kyla. Thank you, Kyla. Sorry, it's kind of hard to look at my voting document and the screen at the same time. All right. Um, any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, I'll go ahead and take the roll call vote. Uh, Justin? Yes. Ken Bacon? Yes, approved. Sarah Banola? Yes. Elizabeth Bradley. Yes. Cassidy Chivers. Yes. Toby and Linder. Yes. Brandon Krieger. Yes. Joel Mark. Yes. Eleanor Mercado. Will Munoz. Yes. Kyla Rowe. Yes. And Hunter Starr. Thank you. All right, well, um, why don't we get into our agenda today? Um, this meeting could be uh, fairly intensive and long, or it might end up being, um, you know, towards the afternoon, we might be very efficient um, and get through a lot. Um, not, not entirely clear yet how extensive our discussion is going to be, but what we wanna do is um, make the most out of the time that we have Sarah here today, who um, might need to um, leave the meeting after lunch and so what I wanna just kind of get to most immediately is the opinion that she worked so hard on um, working remotely 2004, and then jump to the, um, the uh, trust rules uh, issues. As you saw uh, from the agenda, we have a, a double session for the trust rule issues. Um, we sort of anticipated and, you know, discussions with, uh, you know, leadership and the um, state bar staff that there might be a lot to discuss with the trust uh, issues. And given that the state bar um, board of trustees is looking for feedback um, following this meeting, um, we wanna make sure we built in enough time to provide that feedback. Um, however, it, it will end up shaping up, but we can, we can discuss that um, in, in more detail once we get to um, that part of the, the meeting. And, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased, Brandon, I know you've been waiting to talk about the conversion clause opinion. We are definitely getting to that today, I promise. Um, and, and so hopefully we can all give you some um, further feedback on what's you know, de developed really nicely uh, into a great opinion. So with that, let's, let's jump to 20 um, 0004. And Sarah, maybe you could give us um, kind of a, 
reminder as to where we are with this opinion, which I think is ready or close to be ready to uh, be voted out. Sure. So um, we've made some edits in response to, I, you know what, I, I'm i now um, forgetting if we this has gone out for one or two. I think it's gone out for one round of public comment. And we've made some edits in response to those public comments that are reflected in the current red line draft. Um, and I do have a few discussion items. Um, this current draft reflects edits from the last meeting when we discussed this opinion, um, as well as some additional edits made based on the comments at that meeting. And Justin also provided some helpful feedback as well. But, and that's been incorporated into this revised draft. So um, I'll just go through very briefly some of the changes. And then I think I had two items that I wanted to discuss with the group are just questions um, about how to make certain edits. So the beginning, as you see on the screen, um, really um, the first edit and the edit, you know, the deletion on line seven to eight, and then the deletion on lines 22 to 23, that's really just to try to take it, um, not have this opinion be limited to the COVID-19 pandemic type environment, that, that it is more generally applicable. Um, and that's both something that we as uh, a committee have discussed and also we received some public comments on that point. So um, that's kind of the main edit there. And if you could scroll down a little, Mimi, um, I can go over some of the others. So I don't think there's really, the other ones were minor there. Um, so we can go to the second page. Um, and so for this second page, um, we can, we don't really need the stuff highlighted. I think we actually discussed the highlighted items at our last meeting, but they, they stayed in highlight. Um, the changes were made there. Um, so let me just make sure I have this correct. I'm gonna look at my comment because it's hard for me to see on the screen. Sorry, I'm just gonna look at my version real quick. Okay, yeah, I think it was, sorry, I was having trouble finding it on this note. So if you, I think it, it's just not showing up on this version, but there was a comment, I think, um, I can't remember if it was Eleanor or Elizabeth um, who raised this at our, our last meeting about adding something about privacy. Um, and so that's been added to footnote seven, I believe. It's either seven or eight. So I'm not seeing it here though. So maybe it's at the end of footnote eight, Mimi, sorry. If you could scroll down to the next page. Um, yeah, so this last sentence was added um, to refer lawyers to consider applicable privacy laws, particularly if data are hosted outside of the United States. And we referenced um, the ABA rule for this point to comment as well as another state's ethics opinion that addresses that. Um, so even though our opinion isn't really going into this, we wanted to reference that since it's an important issue. And that was raised just in response to one of the comments made at our last meeting that edit was made. Um, I think the other edits in this footnote are really just providing a little bit more detail about what the opinions state. Um, there's not really anything, any material changes there. So um, let me just scroll. I think we should go some of the edits too that were made throughout are we're trying to get rid of anything where we were kind of using the term. We received different pu public comments about the use of the term should, which we had in certain situations and to be cl clear whether it's a must or whether it's really more of a, a practice pointer. So in certain instances where it should be a must, we made that clear. In other instances where it was a suggestion, we tried to just revise the sentences to avoid using the term should. Um, so just to provide some you know, just revise some of these revisions here that you see, even though it looks like a lot, it's really just 
incorporating that change, like reasonable security measures include this. Um, and the opinion makes clear that we're not, you know, saying defining what you know all the reasonable security measures would be. We're providing some examples here. Um, but the one comment I wanted to discuss is on line 79 of the draft there, and I'm going back to my version because it's hard to see the comment on the, that one. But um, I wanted to discuss that. So the one that talks about, let me go back to the screen again. So this, this whole paragraph, um, I wanted to discuss whether we should include it or not. Um, Justin, I think, had raised a comment about whether to include this. Um, this is similar to some guidance that the ABA ethics opinion has provided um, in the past um, when a lawyer knows or reasonably should know that a client or employee is likely to communicate with a lawyer via email or other electronic means using the employer's computers or devices, um, that in that situation, the lawyer must warn the client of the risk that an employer may access and use such electronic communication. Um, but I think Justin's point um, in considering whether we, we need this paragraph is, is it going, you know, do we really need this? Is it more of a practice pointer? You can elaborate, Justin. Um, but so I, I, I just want to raise it with the group about whether, whether or not we should include this type of um, language here in this paragraph or, or just delete it. I, I think it's, it's helpful, but at the same time, it, it could be viewed more of a practice pointer. So I'd like to get the committee's feedback on what they think about this particular paragraph. Um, well, should we just, uh, if you only have a couple more comments, Sarah, should we just run through the rest of um, what you want to discuss and then we'll we'll circle back and sure. get some feedback? And the only edits I made, and I made some edits to it too, this paragraph too, in response to your comment, Justin, just to try to make it clear. And I think I might've tied it, I might've referred as well to, let me just see. I did also add a footnote referring to compare to that ABA opinion I referenced, which was, um, so footnote, it's 12 in my version, but it's now 13 in this version here. So yeah, so that footnote was added just to kind of provide some support too. So now let me, I don't have much more. Let me just scroll down on my version. It's a little bit. Um, the edits under the duty of competence section, the second paragraph, um, we're really just dealing with that issue about must versus should. Um, the only other question I'm trying to think, the only other question I have, uh, two for the groups, let's just see. It's under the duty of com communication section, you had a comment there. Yeah, so it was the section, the line about prospective clients, do you have that? Yeah, so this part that Mimi just put on the screen here that's highlighted. Um, this was something that I think the Bar Association of San Francisco Legal Ethics Committee um, suggested we include, but we talked about it at the last meeting um, about whether we, sh we, we should include it or not. And again, this is because I don't think we all necessarily agreed with this statement and it depends on the facts um, and it really is more of a practice pointer. So I don't think we want to, I think um, on whole, my recommendation would be to delete this sentence, um, but I just wanted to raise it one last time with the group before we do so. If anyone had any opposition to deleting this particular sentence about prospective clients should be advised about the firm's hybrid structure, um, where firms lawyers might not be able to meet in person with the client. All right, so I'm not hearing <laughs> any, any opposition to that deletion. Um, so I think maybe we should go ahead and delete this, this sentence. I know Justin also agreed with that. Uh, he provided some feedback. So let me just see if there's anything else uh, material. You had something else in, uh, what line is this? Like 177-ish, because we deleted a couple things, but um, you had a comment here about- Oh, yes. Okay, so this was again, um, about BYOD policies, um, trying to not, you, you know, it is advisable 
was trying to make it clear that this was not a mandatory requirement. And it is advisable. It's something that the ABA ethics opinions use in some instances as well and, and other state ethics opinions. And it's difficult to balance what kind of language to use here. Um, but I was, you know, the other, I think Justin raised the comment too, maybe we should change it to law firm may consider implementing. Um, I really don't think there's too much of a difference um, in the language, but I, I, I just, from a drafting perspective, um, I wanted to get others feedback if we should use different language than it is advisable. Would you prefer to use um, law firm may consider implementing the OIOB policy? It just, that seems a little bit less concrete. Um, I actually like the term should in this instance, even though I know we try to avoid it overall, but any thoughts on the best language for this? I was curious, I don't remember, why did we take out should? You know, that was, initially we went through and tried to get rid of a lot of the should. Um, one or two of the um, public comments we received really didn't like the term should. Um, in they general, I agree, but I mean, in my mind, I think it applies here. Yeah. yeah, I agree. In this particular case, it's, I think it's the right word. It's the right. It should. It's, yes. Yeah. It's instruction. I mean, that was, that's, yeah. <clears throat> I, I support going back to the should language. Um, I do too, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do too. I think law firm may consider isn't as strong. So I, between law firm may consider and it is advisable, I like it is advisable better, but I actually think should communicates it just as well with fewer words. <laughs> Agreed, that makes sense. Okay. Um, well, Mimi's making those changes. I'm just going to scroll through to make sure there's nothing else um, material in terms of the edits that were made. Let me see. Um, I don't see any further comments. Or, yeah, or, a lot of these edits. Um, other edits, I know it looks like there's more red lines, um, but some of them we discussed at our last meeting, and also some of these edits are really just providing more details, like parentheticals in the footnotes to describe what some of the ethics opinions state. Um, and the highlighted language, I think it's still highlighted from our last meeting, we discussed those points at our last meeting. So I don't think we need to spend time going into it. I can briefly, since you're on that page, Mimi, with the highlighting. Um, this was an edit we made at the last meeting and we wanted to make sure um, it was broad enough. So it was revised to just say, managerial lawyers, lawyers overseeing, non-lawyers or other lawyers. We didn't want to limit it to, I think initially we had said associates, paralegal, we just didn't want to limit it. So we tried to broaden it here, but that's somewhat of a minor edit. I, I don't really think there's anything of, any other material edits that were made um, since our last meeting? Nope, it looks and, like that's it. Nope, that looks like it, that's all. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. and. So I will pause here and just for anyone who's reviewed this in advance of the meeting, if you have any additional feedback, um, if you could let us know, that would be helpful now. Otherwise, I think we should turn to maybe considering to, whether to vote this out. So is there any other feedback on this draft opinion? I, I have some feedback, but I'll, if, if others um, do too, I, I'll, I'll pause. I, I had a couple of points. On uh, page seven, lines 194, 195. Uh, which language? It's on page eight now, I guess. Okay. Uh, well, maybe not. Uh, things have shifted since we deleted a few things. It's the paragraph that begins managerial lawyers and lawyers overseeing. Yes, I got it right here. Uh, let me put it all on one page. Yeah, okay. Must maintain regular communications to oversee their work. I mean, I, I, I agree with the concept. 
I'm not sure what regular communication means. And I guess the concern I have, maybe it's beyond this, but I mean, in, in the fee arbitration world, that is a constant source of billing abuse managerial lawyers emailing back and forth and communicating with one another and then billing their clients for that. I don't know if it's appropriate to, I don't know how we would address that here, but that was a kind of the concern I, um, you, know. you want to soften the, the word regular and make it more in tune with the, the purpose of overseeing, which is to ensure that Maybe they're adequately. Yeah, I just, yeah, so I adequate just like manager of lawyers and lawyers must oversee to make sure they're adequate. Yeah, you know, I, I must oversee their work or something to that effect. The regular communications part is what concerned me because, like I said, that typically shows up as emails back and forth or intra office conferences that get billed to the client. So I think if it says, you know, lawyers must oversee their work. I mean, that I think, I, I, think I like communications because the, the idea that if you're remote, you need to do something maybe a little more than you would if you were in the office overseeing someone's work. So you have to do that, whether that's you know, having a having a Zoom call or a few more check-in emails. Um, certainly not saying that check-in emails need to be billed to the client, but um, that that's part of the like not letting paralegals or associates kind of fall fall through the tr the cracks on a case. But that's well, a good point. I, I guess I was losing track of the remote part of this. <laughs> this whole yeah. thing is about remote work. And I, yeah, and I agree with Kyla's point there as well. That that's what I I had in mind with, with the, the sentence. Um, and Kyla articulated it very well. Um, and I yeah, and I don't think just by having this, we're not really addressing the. I I, get, I understand your point about the the billing issue, and realize yeah, that is that is a disputed issue too. And I know a lot of carriers make clear that you, you shouldn't be billing for that type of thing. But I I don't think we're addressing the billing issue. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm convinced. <laughs> so you, you are you saying, uh, Sarah and Ken, you're okay with the regular the word regular, or you want to change the word regular to something like adequate, sufficient, something like that? No, I'm I'm fine with regular. I mean, I don't know. You know, it's it's kind of vague as to what it means, but um, I I don't per se have a problem with it. I get my my my. I was. I was losing track that this is dealing more specifically with the remote situation. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay as written. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Well, um, while folks consider um, other thoughts. Let me let me jump in with a few. Um, uh, on footnote seven, this is very nitpicky, but since we're voting this out for something today, probably I just wanted to flag. I think we need to say. Um, Do you mean a different footnote, uh, Justin? For for uh, now, it's footnote eight. Okay. So four additional factors. That one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it says well beyond the scope of this ethics opinion. It would also be prudent for lawyers. So add an S after lawyer. To consider applicable privacy laws, comma, particularly if data. R. It, R is, is it R? Is it plural? I, I just wanted to make sure we meant that. Is it yeah. R? Okay. Yeah, okay. it is plural. That's fine. Um, on this question about the, uh, I get it. Page three, the one, the the uh, in addition to ensuring that confidential data is secure in their own home working environments, you know the one about advising clients about being careful, that one, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm still in favor of removing this. Um, it's it, the way that it 
it's phrased, it makes it sound like a, a lawyer has an obligation to always give some kind of advice to their clients about being careful when they work remotely. And let's face it, um, all clients, at least most of mine are at some point or another having to work from home still, or will be working from home still, given the, the, the world that we um, will live in and will live in. So it, it seems to be setting up a duty in all instances, because clients are always going to, or m many of them are going to be working from home. And I just don't think we need to set up that kind of duty um, for purposes of this opinion. And I'm not sure how it ties, because uh, full disclosure, I have not uh, read the ABA opinion in footnote 11, but that talks about giving this type of warning where there's a significant risk that a third party may gain access. And I don't know when that significant risk exists. Is it whenever a client is working from home, there's a significant risk, or is that ABA opinion talking about some narrow circumstance like if if the lawyer knows that a client, you know, habitually works at the airport and uses airport internet, you know, that that's a significant risk situation. I have no idea, but it doesn't seem to jive with what could be construed in the text here of our opinion as a general duty to advise clients because we know that they're always are often working from home. So I have concerns about including this paragraph, at least as phrased, and I would be in favor either of um, one, just deleting it, or two, being more precise about this concept that's in the footnote about when a significant risk exists such that this type of um, warning to a client um, must be given. Because I, I just don't think it, we can say or want to say that basically whenever you have a client you have to give them this warning because let's face it all our clients or many of our clients are working remotely these days yeah I, I i understand your point justin and i think it really is fact dependent too and also depends to some extent on the sophistication of the client um so i i, I don't you know after hearing what you said i i would also support removing this um paragraph and just just for background the aba opinion which is why i used to compare wasn't addressing the the identical situation. It was something with a, although it wasn't limited to the situation, the, the hy hypothetical in that case, um, although the opinions worded a little more broadly, was dealing with a employer and a council representing employees. So uh, an employment law council representing an employee, um, and they knew the employee was using the employer's computer or work mm -hmm. email account to communicate with the lawyer. And in that situation, it, a duty arose and this fact this fact pattern is very different so um i i would support um <coughs> removing this paragraph unless others um disagree so and i i agree with removing it and then if we didn't you know the language that concerned me was lawyers should consider reminding their clients because one that's not only kind of vague, but reminding implies you already did it pursuant to some other duty to advise clients earlier on. So, but overall, I agree with just taking it out. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, on the uh, the other uh, sentence um, where there was a question about whether we would delete the one that's prospective clients should be advised about the firm's hybrid structure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't have super strong feelings on this one. I, I'm, I'm good with deleting it. If that's um, what you, you Sarah, and the, the other committee members um, feel is the best approach, I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't have any um, objection to that. Um, for those who might feel differently or in the camp of, well, hey, it's helpful to say this. Um, I think that the caveat in the sentence where it says to the extent um, gives some wiggle room. So we're not always saying that, look, if you have a hybrid structure, you have to give such and such disclosure. There is a, a, a caveat or limitation there. So um, because of that, I would also be okay in, in, including it but I, I have no strong feeling one way or the other. Um, as far as this language, 
uh, in what was, uh, don't know what the line number is anymore, but it was the, it is advisable language. And then we talked about whether that would be a, sh we should revise that to say should um, implement a BYOD policy. Um, you know, my, my recollection is we had a fair amount of back and forth about the could and should and would uh, type of diction in this opinion. So I, I just have a, a bit of a reaction to now changing this to should um, at, this, at this stage, uh, including because I'm not sure I agree with it, um, but also because we we've, we've vetted it already. And this the idea that a law firm has to have a policy, I, I, I'm not entirely sure in what circumstances that would be true. Um, certainly the lawyer, the individual lawyer has an obligation to maintain confidentiality and law firms can support that. But what are we citing for the obligation of the law firm to implement a specific policy on this? Um, if we're going to go there and say it's a should or it's a, I'm sorry, it's a must um, type thing or a should type of situation, um, I'm wondering if we need a, some kind of citation to support that, if we're going to go that route and, and kind of um, strengthen what we're saying here about the, the law firm's obligation. Justin, um, I've got a sort of a, a higher altitude view of this. And I mean, you look at um, bring your own device, and we're talking about what a law firm or an individual lawyer should do if they bring their own device? I mean, is there a, a more inherent risk with a uh, computer device that doesn't exist with bringing your own briefcase to put it, your, your confidential documents in? I mean, if we're talking about this being directed to working remotely, um, I would be happy to, if there's some heightened risk that doesn't exist with any other means of communication or storage or whatever, uh, we should highlight it. But if not, then I don't think it, it, it really fits in with this. Um, same thing with reminding the client about uh, commuting on a, uh, I mean, um, communicating on a device uh, that a hacker can get to. Well, I mean, you know, communicating in a crowded building with people who could listen would create the same risk. Are we telling everybody they've got to take extra care to do that? So looking at all these comments now that I'm hearing everybody talking about it, I don't see that we're highlighting anything that exists specific to um, remote working uh, environments that doesn't exist generally anyway. So Joel, just in response to that point, um, and also Justin's point, um, I, I do think, you know, in the remote environment, attorneys and staff are, who aren't going into the office regularly, they're likely, unless the law firm is supplying the device, which they could be, but they're, they're likely going to be working on their personal computers or personal laptops. And so there's more of a risk in the, when lawyers and staff are working remotely. And it's cited here as well. Um, this is a point that's highlighted as, as very important in the ABA ethics opinion. Um, and I think, I don't know what footnote it is in this draft. Maybe if you scroll down, it might be 35. The, the relevant ABA ethics opinion, which is 498, talks about um, BYOD policies. And, um, and I'm just looking at it now too on my screen talking about one particularly important subject to supervise is the firm's BYOD policy. Um, if lawyers or non-lawyer assistants will be using their own devices to access, transmit, or store client-related information, then it talks about some stuff the policy should address. Um, so I, I do think um, referencing the BYOD issue is, is important because I think that that is a heightened risk in the remote environment and, and we should do so. I don't have a problem with, you know, suggesting alternative language, um, even though I, I do personally like the word should, um, but if we wanted, I wouldn't be opposed to 
changing it to it is advisable to just make it extra clear that it's we're not saying it's a mandatory duty necessarily in all cir circumstances. Um, and I don't think should necessarily mean sex. We're not using must, but I wouldn't be opposed to changing it to it is advisable. Well, do uh, we do we say somewhere in here? Do we outline what these extraordinary additional risks are? It would seem to me that if we're going to talk about additional duties um, that might apply where you're working remotely, they should be addressed to the specific risks involved. And since I mean, I, I'm asking hypothetically myself because I don't really I'm not uh, up on what those additional risks might be, but I don't imagine that every attorney that this is going to be applicable to is also up on those additional risks. So if we're going to talk about the additional precautions that must be taken when you're working remotely, I think we ought to identify those additional risks specifically so we know what we're talking about. I'm looking at it from a more of a consumer point of view as the, the lawyer who's going to read this for guidance than for, um, you know, uh, what the ethical obligation is. Yeah, I, I think it's somewhat, um, you know, here it, it does say to the extent law firm permits lawyers to use their own devices while working remotely. And it talks about certain BYOD practices here and security measures that lawyers might not necessarily have on their own personal devices, like um, making sure a password, antivirus, firewall, encryption um, in your, you know, lawyers should, but they, not all, all lawyers or staff who's working remotely on confidential client data would necessarily have take all of these extra security precautions as you would on a, would be included on the work provided device in the office, the traditional law firm office. So, um, yeah, the, the firm that I was at, um, when we started going remotely had a big issue with people's emails getting hacked because they were using their phones to send the emails. And I admittedly had no idea that that was less safe, just like downloading the Outlook app and logging into my law firm email was actually not as safe as if I went in on my remote desktop on my computer and sent an email from there. So we had to have whole trainings about, you know, we need these like, um, two-factor authentication, yeah. all of these kinds of things for the apps that we use that will have client information in it. And what I, to, to go to Justin's point about law firm should, um, I was under the impression that, and, and I'll admit that I don't, I don't know what exact uh, rule it is that is causing that, but I, I always thought that it is the law firm and the, the firms that I've been at all have an overarching policy about devices and, and, and the lawyers have to sign, you know, the agreement that I'm going to do this with my device and keep it up to date and run this much uh, antivirus uh, software and all of that. Um, so I always thought that that was a more efficient way to do it, to have the law firm prescribe the BYOD uh, as opposed to just saying, each lawyer needs to come up with their own um, way of doing it. I just always thought from a risk management perspective, that makes more sense, but that's, you know, that's not citing to any, any actual rule there. Yeah. And I, I think the duty of confidentiality and the duty of supervision um, tend to support this, but it's not to say that BYOD policy is the only way you, you could necessarily meet those obligations, I think. Yeah, um, well, that, that's, that's like what I'm... In a small firm environment, it might be something that you can do a little less formally. Um, but yeah, so I, I just, yeah. But I do think it's still an important point to make, um, even if it's we're not saying it's a, you know, a duty. I think, I think it's important to leave it in. Um, I think it's from, from a, it, it seems to me integral to an overarching firm remote policy policy basket and um, the, the, the kind of um, example that Kyla was just talking about. I really believe that uh, 
that it is useful to not useful and important to include it here. So um, yeah, just to clarify, I'm not suggesting I disagree with should, it's more of uh, whether there are either exceptions to this or folks might take issue with it being um, suggested that a BYOD policy is the only way for a firm to comply with its obligations. And so then tying that to what I was saying before about wanting to get some kind of rule hook here that we could use to maybe refine this. Um, what what I'm, as we're talking, I, I'm looking at, you know, rule 5.1, which we, we do cite as what used to be footnote 34. Um, I'm not sure what footnote it is now, but then at comment two, it does incorporate this idea that law firms um, um, and their structures are going to impact um, whether an individual lawyer has made sufficient efforts, right, to, um, to, to manage and supervise. And so um, I do think there is a, a rule hook, or in this case, a comment hook that we could um, use just to, to bolster the point we're trying to make. I think we all agree that it's an important point. I don't think anyone's suggesting we should remove the BYO, BYOD comment. I think it's more of a matter of how we're going to say it's either advisable to consider doing it this way as, as a law firm, having a BYOD policy, um, as opposed to saying that that is the way that, it, that, that law firms have to um, help facilitate protection of confidential information, things along those lines. So uh, to me, this is more of a wordsmithing issue um, slash let's maybe consider um, updating what used to be rule uh, footnote 34 to maybe also incorporate comment two or, or something along those lines. Um, Justin, just to clarify, uh, I'm not, not clear what you're saying about up Maybe if you could, which footnote are you talking about updating and including a comment to? What's the comment it, you would add? It's not, now footnote 36. It used to be, I'm looking at a version where it was a different number. Okay, I thought that went to a different point, but let me just. Um, it's in the same paragraph. That's why I'm thinking about it. So 36 appears at the end of the paragraph and 35, which is the reference to the ABA is after the BYOD discussion. Yeah, I don't think the point you're talking about, Justin, fits in footnote 36. So, so what 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 comp what footnote were you suggesting we add about the to the BYOD issue? Well, it might be that we just need to have another footnote. Um, I mean, it's all part of the same paragraph. So, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to your discretion um, whether you think that it needs to be a separate footnote or we can kind of mash it together. I don't really, I don't really care. But it really depends on you know what what our conclusion is about this this language. It is advisable versus should, and how and and how we're going to justify if we if we're going to say should or must or something along those lines. How are we going to justify that? Um, I think we need to tie it to a rule. I don't think we can just say that if we're going to take such a strong approach, particularly in light of you know how we've kind of gone back and forth on this already. I mean, would you maybe want to put it here? Yeah, you could. I mean, yes, you can put it there. That's fine. Yeah. For what it's worth, I'm in, this is Eleanor, I'm in favor of a lighter touch on this too, kind of reminding attorneys of their obligations and maybe suggesting these policies are one way to approach them, but I, I don't think they're the only way. And I'm in looking at this, I'm uncomfortable with the suggestion, the reasonable BYOD practices include language as well, because um, there are a whole lot of reasonable ways to create secure access. And I think this could suggest that these are ways that should be incorporated. I, I, and given changes in technology as well, I, I don't know that we should be going and uh, be getting that specific about how folks should 
gas policies. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing for us to say that law firms, you know, they've got to do something, right, to protect um, confidentiality and ensure their lawyers are protecting confidentiality, which is the point of, I think, of our first sentence. Okay, so if that's mm -hmm. going to be a little stronger, I get it. Um, being more general about, yes, law firms, they, they got to protect, help protect things like confidential information. But then to, to, to give an example of BYOD policies and basically suggest that that's a should um, as opposed to an option, um, you know, the, it, it is advisable language suggests more of an option than a, than a, a mandate. Uh, I think that as Eleanor is suggesting, might be a step too far, particularly since we've already made the point in the first sentence, which I think is the, the more important point, that law firms have to do something, right? They can't just sit on their hands and not ensure, you know, use their managerial uh, obligations to ensure that their lawyers are, um, you know, complying with the rules, including protecting confidentiality. If this is Bill. I mean, what about... Because it sounds like this is the BYOD is an example of your suggestion the adjustment, maybe at least that's what I'm understanding. Why not make that specific in the paragraph ex itself, say, as an example of such policy, there are BYOD policies that, you know, include security measures such as passwords and whatnot. So you're, it's an example. It's not exclusive. It's just a way and that would, you know, with developing technology, there may be other ways, but this is just one example that that lawyers or law firms have used or, or do use to implement these these uh, security measures that are required by Rule Five Point One. So maybe clearly state this is just an example. Maybe that's in a footnote or in the text of the paragraph itself. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's my personal preference is, um, and that's consistent with the language we had before where we were saying it is advisable, you know, it's, right. it's an option. Um, whereas, again, in the first paragraph, first sentence, rather, we're making the mandate clear, and then we're providing examples of, you know, what good practices might be and so on. Um, so anyway, that that's my view. It sounds like it, Eleanor and, and Bill would be on board with that. I don't know how. Um, is there any, anybody who hasn't chimed in here that wants to um, let us know what they're thinking? We could always just soften the should implement. Uh, Randy, I think it's Randy who suggests should consider among other approaches or changing it to could instead of should or moving it to a footnote. Yeah, so I, I think um, based on the feedback received, what, what if, um, so after this first sentence, um, we could start out before this it, it is a good practice. Um, I don't know. I was trying to incorporate the example language that Bill mentioned, but maybe say um, here, use that as an example, comma, it is a good practice. And then the next sentence could be, um, we could revise it back to how I, how I think I originally had it in the initial red line to say um, law. For, it is to go back to the it is advisable language. Just make it even clearer that it's a practice pointer. Um, is advisable for a law firm to implement. I think, and then get rid of should. And in response to, I think it was Eleanor's um, comment, we could move the footnote 36, uh, I'm not sure if it's 36, I'm sorry, 35. Um, we don't wanna actually speci spe specify some of the security measures that are supported by that footnote. We could just point to the, we could just delete that sentence, but leave the footnote 35 there if we don't want to spell out any reasonable security measures. I would I would be in favor of that. Yeah, I, I, I would be in favor of that too. So we would delete this sentence, but keep the footnote? Yeah, and I think the footnote fits at the end of the prior sentence um, still, so. I'm talking about the footnote 
referring to the ABA opinion? Yes, and also the ACC yeah. um, pointers on BYOD policies. Right, right. So do I have it right then? Yes, that looks okay. good, I think. Just making sure. So I don't know, I think that incorporates um, the points that I, I know a, a few of the members had made on, on the, this particular paragraph, but did I miss anything, sir? Does this work for everyone? That works for me, Elizabeth. Okay, well. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Joel. Or Ken, sorry. Okay, so were there any other comments to other sections of the opinion? I had one based on something Justin had said earlier. Um, on page three, it was line 62. Still is, okay. Because he mentioned airports and other remote sites. And here we seem to be limiting it to a home office. So I, I, I'm questioning whether that's just too limited or any, or whether we want to address, you know, other remote locations, like when you're working at a hotel, uh, airport. Um, yeah, I, I understand your point, but I just think the overall context of the opinion and the hypo is just dealing with lawyers who are working from their home and not just, you know, occasionally you know, traveling. I, I think we, I think COPAC has another opinion too that briefly addresses like the lawyer at a local Starbucks, um, you know, logging onto their laptop and using the public Wi Fi. Um, I don't know. To me, to me, the overall scope of the opinion, it's, it's focused on kind of the home office type environment as opposed to being at an airport or at a hotel room. So I don't know that we need to spell it out, you know, give those other examples here. Um, although I don't disagree that, you know, these same duties would apply in that type of situation. Well, could we footnote that other opinion that talks about those remote locations? Because I think the, the risk is still there. Yeah, and, and I don't have that handy. I can try to pull it up quickly. I would offer kind of the same general comment about avoiding getting into the security measures and what reasonable measures include, or at least softening it by saying might include. Oh, Sarah, you're on mute. Okay, you're good now. Yeah, I'm just looking at that sentence. That I'm, I'm fine with changing it to, to might include. Can I make one just small suggestion? Um, here when it says when working from home, lawyers must implement reasonable measures to safeguard confidential client information, particularly as other household members may share or have access to a home computer or laptop or printer. Um, because, I, well, <laughs> from personal experience, I, I work from home with my husband who works from home, who's also a lawyer, and we actually do share a printer. Um, so we need to, I need to get a new printer. But um, it's, uh, I think that it, it, it's just not limited to the computer itself, but other means of producing confidential information. That makes sense. So go ahead and add it. 
Did you consider changing the particularly as to um, if? Sorry, I don't know where, which as you're referring to. This is to. when, sorry, particularly as other household oh, members yeah. strikes me as almost like we're assuming they do. Maybe oh, I see. That's a good point. My, my read of it, but I would say if. Do we need the may then? Can we just say particularly if other household members share or have access to a home computer? Yeah. That would be fun for me. I don't think it changes the meaning really. It's just a necessary word. <laughs> Since we're adding the if. I also had a question on line 69 to 70, where it talks about disabling the listening unless needed to assist with legal services. And the footnote refers to the ABA opinion, which uh, I looked at that because I was curious what it meant. And they just basically same thing, have a, have a statement to that effect. But I'm not sure what does that mean? What, why would it be necessary to have listening enabled devices to assist with your legal services. I guess unless maybe you're, uh, I mean, if there's some disability reason for that, otherwise I, that, I didn't understand what that meant. There could be a that was a change we well. previously made based on someone's, that was a comment that's, I, I thought we just addressed that particular issue previously. And that was some language that we had agreed on um that 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 clarification i don't think that was in the original unless that's that, basically what the aba opinion it says the same thing essentially unless needed okay yeah, unless needed without any explanation what that means i'm trying to envision a situation where you would have to have a virtual assistant you know have siri or alexa enabled to assist with your legal services. I just, I, I don't, you know, maybe I'm not, I just don't know what that means. Like I said, the only thing I could come up with is like, oh, if like, you know, you have some physical disability that you have to use Alexa to, or, or, or you know, or Siri to do something. That's what I, I thought of. I mean, or I like listening able. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say very similar. That's kind of what I envisioned was like a, some, something to translate if you're having trouble translating with a client or um, if the yeah. client's having trouble hearing or something like that. But that wouldn't be like an Alexa yeah. or a Siri. That would be like a more sophisticated yeah. software. But listening enabled device is pretty, it's a pretty vague phrase not saying, you know, connected to the public internet or public, you know, public cloud or it doesn't relate to storage. I think it's pretty, pretty broad. So I'm not in favor of, of making this more restrictive. I could see people using it to transcribe, you know, all, for all kinds of potential uses. I think okay. the real, for me, the real issue is informed consent. Like if the client's okay with it, if there's some risk, the lawyer should get consent and you know, should understand the risk. And, and obtain consent. Okay, yeah, it's, it, I, it, I wasn't sure what that meant. So I figured if I was somewhat having confusion or questions, others might as well, so that's all. Um, and going back just briefly, cause I was trying to pull that, I, I don't remember, I think it was Joel perhaps who was that suggesting we, drop a footnote to the COPRAC opinion I had mentioned. And uh, we've gotten a little, <laughs> I actually, Mimi, do you remember what's, uh, where that sentence was that we were, I think it was a little bit higher. Um, it was the first sentence of that paragraph. It's oh, it was, okay. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so I don't think if we drop the footnote there, this opinion really, it would ha we'd have to add something to the footnote to say, I think. So I, the opinion is um, that I was, briefly read, mentioning it was 2010-179, and that's the one that deals with um, an attorney who goes to, takes his laptop, 
to the local coffee shop and uses a public Wi-Fi internet connection to connect legal research. Um, so I, I, I don't know if we wanted to add, I mean, to address both Ken and I guess Joel's follow-up point. Um, it seems like we, I wouldn't want to just drop a C to this because it doesn't really necessarily support that first sentence. It really just supports that this kind of duty applies in all types of um, not really remote environments. It, I, I was just, I don't know, I'm not really clearly seeing that we need to go into, you know, if an attorney is working from a coffee shop or a hotel or in any kind of remote environment, they would need to undertake confidentiality measures. It seems like that's the point we want to make. It's not just when you're working from your home office. Well, I think the footnote could simply read then that um, uh, this applies to other remote situations. See Cal 210-179. That would work. Um, um, also, by the way, just as an aside, uh, we have a couple of um, comments in the Q&A. One is a process, uh, our process, question, which is a pretty good one, is how can someone follow along with what we're doing better? And then the other one uh, is a, um, a subject matter comment, which talks about some other potential devices, I mean, other potential procedures that might help in keeping confidentiality in a law firm setting. And um, probably be a good idea to just give some consideration to what these people are chiming into us here. Thanks, Joe. We'll take a look at that at a break. Um, <clears throat> see if there's anything that we can uh, do about that. Yeah, and just um, briefly, I, I do note that this version that Mimi has up on her screen is the same as the version that was circulated with our agenda. Um, it's not a different version. But we don't um, we don't post the red lines typically. Oh, okay. It's more for the um, committee members to streamline the review process to just seeing what was changed, gotcha. which is reason. Plus, also making them ADA compliant, the red lines is quite time consuming. And oftentimes we get our materials in pretty late. Gotcha. So I try not to hold up the posting by only posting the clean version. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'm just, Mimi, could you go back up to the, I'm just trying to see how this footnote works with the first sentence again. Well, working from home, Lord, she can't be so Okay. And then if you could go, go back to the footnote, sorry to repeat, I'm just trying to, uh, this, maybe we could just say this duty applies to other remote situations and then put a full site to the, I think that works. Um, I believe, but I'll, this was, Ken, it was, does that work for you? I know you had raised this comment initially about not just limited necessarily. Yeah, to it, generally that does the, well, the part about applies to the remote situations. I, I, I haven't had a chance to pull up 2010-179 to see exactly what it says. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think generally, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm good with the footnote. Okay. Um, I know we'll we'll clean up some of this, um, but is there are there any other um, suggested edits or comments to the other sections of the ethics opinion? So not hearing any, I think um, we should consider whether to vote this out now subject only to kind of clean up um, non-substantive edits, um, like putting the full site for this um, Cal State Bar ethics opinion and I don't know if there's any other typos of, or things of that nature. But otherwise, I think this might be ready um, to vote out. And I'll, Justin, what are your thoughts? Um, well, and just to clarify with respect to voting out, um, are we talking about to go to the Board of Trustees? Are you thinking we need another round of public comment? What What are you thinking? Mimi, could you confirm, um, just because this, this got a little bit delayed, and so I, my 
my memory's off. Did this go through one round of public comment so far? Um, it's gone through one round of public comment. It was uh, a 90 day public comment period. Um, I believe because I would say substantively, we've added quite a few things and also changed some shoulds to must that it probably should go back out for public comment. Some people might not agree with the strength of some of our statements now, who knows? Um, if it does go out for public comment again, it will be for 60 days. Okay. Okay, so um, sounds like the proposal on the table then is to vote this out for a 60 day public comment subject to some uh, minor cleanup that we'll do before the version that goes to the public is uh, disseminated. Is that, uh, are we on the same page about that? Yes, the staff would do the site checks and, you know, fix any typos and clean up um, any citation formatting. Okay. So Sarah, are you, are you comfortable with that? I am comfortable with that, yes. Okay, great. Well then um, I'll make a, I'd like to make a motion um, to do just that then, um, have the 60 day public comment. Um, and then we'll, we'll do some minor cleanup um, before it's disseminated to the public along the lines of what we just discussed. I'll second. Thank you, Joel. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and take the roll call vote. Justin Fields? Uh, yes. Ken Bacon? Yes. Sarah Bonola. Yes. Elizabeth Bradley. Yes. Cassidy Chivers. Yes. Toby and Linder. Yes. Brendan Krieger. Yes. Joel Mark. Yes. Eleanor Mercado. Yes. Bill Munoz. Yes. Kyla Rowe. Yes. And Hunter Starr. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for all your hard work um, on this. And it will be uh, great to get some more public comment and then hopefully um, finalize this opinion. Um, thank you so much. Well, um, anything else on uh, 20 triple four? All right. Um, why don't we move then to the trust rules and um, <laughs> take advantage of the time we have Sarah here today. Um, what, uh, what I think uh, I mentioned earlier, we're envisioning is um, this conversation extending after the lunch break. So we'll get through as much as we can. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments about the trust rule issues, since I know that some of the um, revisions and proposals in the uh, the rules are not. Uh, agreed upon by all committee members. Uh, I want to just offer a couple of thoughts as we work through these proposed uh, changes. One is that the, you know, the Board of Trustees has directed us to provide feedback on these um, draft rule changes. And so, you know, it, from my perspective, at least, it's not our job to endorse or approve uh, these changes at, at this stage, but rather to provide the best input we can um, under the direction that we've been given um, and, and offer that as timely as we can, understanding that we, we are under time constraints and there's only so much that can be done, particularly if we don't necessarily have consensus on, on the propriety of the edits. But that, I don't think that that is the purpose of our discussion today to agree or disagree with the edits, but rather to try to make them as, um, yes, as acceptable to the committee uh, overall, but also to get a consensus on what we can um, send to the Board of Trustees for their consideration. And related to that, um, from my perspective, um, one of the helpful goals of uh, this discussion that we're gonna have is to um, you know, kind of summarize where we might have disagreement or concern with the proposed um, rule changes that are going to go to the state bar so that we can provide with um, whatever work product goes to the state bar a cover note that lets them know that we 
you know, this is this is not necessarily, you know, what we are endorsing and blessing, but we're complying with the instructions that we've been given to provide our feedback and that COPRAC or its committee members um, may may indeed have public comment to provide um, once we see the, the actual rules that go out for public comment so that it's clear to the board of trustees that um, members of this committee um, might have different views and thoughts to provide um, that are the, relative to the, the rules uh, edits that we might be sending out to the board of trustees uh, later this month. So I just wanna be real clear about that, that you don't necessarily have to agree with these rule uh, edits um, that are being proposed. Um, that's understandable. But our, our job today is to try to, to marshal these as best we can um, under the instructions that we've been given. And then to, I think, uh, appropriately provide some kind of explan explanatory letter as to our views so that it's clear um, what we are doing, what we have done, and that there um, may be uh, disagreements um, or among the committee members and that those will be addressed via public comment. Um, so I just wanted to offer that kind of high level background before we dig into it. Um, what I'm thinking makes the most sense, subject to somebody telling me otherwise, is um, for uh, probably Sarah to um, give us just an overview of what the subcommittee has worked on and, um, and to talk us through the outline um, that was prepared for this meeting. And then we can dig into um, the, um, the proposed rule revisions. I think we'll take them in a, in a specific order, which I'll get to um, once we hear from Sarah and, and address any um, you know, initial comments that any committee members have. All right, so that's, I, I talked too much. Um, Sarah, let me, let me turn it over to you for You're muted, Sarah. So I was saying Joel helped to coordinate our, our subcommittee meeting on this. Um, and the, the subcommittee met and we went over um, the proposed amendments to the two rules um, and kind of suggested some um, alternative language, talked about some issues we saw with some of the um, proposed rule changes um just from a high level perspective it, it it seems that um most of the um subcommittee members did have concerns about the rebuttable presumption in proposed rule 1.15 um but there were a lot of areas in which we, we had agreement on as well and um the outline it was really that's you see an agenda is intended just to kind of summarize the subcommittee's viewpoints and perspectives on the proposed rule changes, starting with just our overall considerations and then going into each of the proposed revisions. Um, since we submitted this outline as part of the agenda material, and I think based on other feedback from our initial COPRAC meeting and, and some email correspondence um, between the um, subcommittee members um, currently on the agenda, um, there are um, slightly revised versions of the proposed rules than what we saw at the last meeting, um, trying to incorporate some of the feedback um, from the subcommittee. So I think we should maybe start um, with the proposed revision to Rule 1.15 D7, um, because that seems to be less controversial. Um, and if you could pull that up. And this is the one that removing the as requested by the client or other person language. Um, sorry, <laughs> I don't have it memorized, so I can't without the screen. <laughs> let, let me uh, pull up my own version. Uh, where is it? Okay. It's D7, Mimi, so a little bit further. Oops. Yeah. Um, 
So this is uh, removing the, the requirement that the, before the attorney's duty to promptly distribute undisputed funds or property, um, that there first has to be a request from the, the client or other person. Um, the, this proposed revision is consistent with what was originally proposed. Um, the subcommittee members as a whole um, didn't have any objections to this proposed removal. It's, it's not part of, um, it's inconsistent with the ABA model rule and other state counterparts to have this be a, a threshold requirement that the client make the request first. Um, we have not yet had a chance as a subcommittee to review any, I know this is one point Justin had raised, any case law or executive summary to the rule to understand the significance of the fact that um, as requested by the client or other person. Um, but from a client protection standpoint, um, there doesn't seem to be any real need for, for there to be a request first from the client before the attorney's duty arises. And so the subcommittee supported this edit. One thing that's mentioned in our outline, um, I just wanna pull up real quick, um, is um, a suggestion that their comment be added to clarify that subsection D7 is not intended to apply to advanced fees or the client file. So, I will, um, I'd like to get if there, first, first of all, I just want to see if anyone has any concerns with the proposed proposal to delete the requirement that there be a request from the client before the attorney has an obligation to promptly distribute undisputed funds or property. Does anyone have any concerns with that proposed removal? Well, no concern with the comment nope. but, uh, with removing the as requested language as long as the comment clarifies. Okay, and the comment is the one that I that's in the outline right Joel. Um, to clarify that it's not intended to apply to advanced fees or, or client. Um, the client file is that the comment just to confirm. You're on mute I don't know if you were responding Joel. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, do any other members have any concerns with that deletion? I, I, the, the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow you. The comment is going to be that it doesn't apply to advanced fees or the file. Or the client file. The client file, I um, you know, promptly distribute any undisputed funds. What, I, I guess I'm not following why that wouldn't apply to an advanced deposit or advanced fees. Can, um, you know, when I, a matter seems to be terminated. There is an advance fee remaining in the trust account. Um, to know whether it's what the client wants to do with it, um, you really have to inquire to the client. Do, you, do they want you to hold it in case something else comes up? Do they want you to hold it for a different matter? Um, and I just think it would, um, that's just something that's only between the client and the lawyer. And um, I just don't see why it should be a, a presumed violation. Um, so, yeah. A presumed violation. Okay. I also think it's more of a timing issue too that you, that Joel pointed out here is, I mean, he mentioned the termination um, when the matter terminates, but typically, I mean, the property could be construed as undisputed, the client's entitled to it, but My, uh, not, during the course of the representation, the client file is something that the attorney typically has, sends copies to the client, and there's some op the separate rule that just governs on the termination of the representation, what you're supposed to do with the client file. Um, 
Well, also, also, it, what about a will safe uh, you, where you're keeping um, their, you know, the trust and testamentary documentation of the client? There's no dispute, but I'm, I'm not, not sure if you're showing up on your end. My, my internet seems to be uh, unstable and I've dropped off two or three times and then it reconnects. I don't know if that shows on your end, but so I missed part of the conversation where Joel and I were going back and forth on the advance fees. I'm not, I'm not sure where that left. I just kicked back in. <laughs> Yeah, Joel, do you want to repeat your comment on the advance fee issue? Oh, that I, the, the one about there's a lot of reasons why uh, an advanced deposit, um, the client may want you to keep it, want the attorney to keep it. Same thing with a will safe, um, you know, testamentary documents. Uh, those are some examples that come to mind. And they really aren't the problem that is trying to be addressed by these revisions. So I think it would be helpful to clarify that it doesn't apply in those cases. Yeah, I mean, when you read when you read D7 literally, with that, with the as requested language removed, it literally means. You just distribute anything that's undisputed in terms of funds or property to a client without any context. Well, without any context, that doesn't make any sense or without a comment to clarify, because it would literally mean that if you're holding advanced fees, you just have to promptly distribute it, right? Because it's property of the client, arguably, or, or a, a, a will say or whatever it is. And that's, just, that's not the purpose of D7 with this change. What it's trying to get at is, you know, you get settlement funds or, or something along those lines that you need to distribute to a client. The client's not expecting you to just promptly distribute advanced fees or a will, will save that you're supposed to be protecting or whatever it is. So the comment is also necessary to avoid a, a literal reading of D7 that you produce, or excuse me, that you distribute anything that's undisputed in terms of funds or property to a client which um, read literally just doesn't make any sense. It's not the purpose of D7. Yeah, I, I get it, I agree. So it, I don't see a comment in this um, that's been drafted yet in, in the materials that we have. So um, it seems like this would be a helpful exercise um, for us to um, include in whatever we submit to the board of trustees. Um, it, it, does anyone disagree with that? I agree. And maybe just for our future reference, could you maybe add to the pro proposal um, I don't know if it's trust property, what would be the proper term, Joel, that you're referring to? Well, when the client file, I guess, includes uh, all those things that the client usually relies upon the lawyer to maintain in a will safe, for instance. Okay, like, so maybe it's adequately covered by client file. Like their trust, their will, their... Uh, power of a durable power of attorney, all those kinds of things. That, that makes are... sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm thinking, just as a matter of efficiency, and again, I'm, I'm really open to what, especially the subcommittee members uh, who worked on this um, think, but um, it seems like we have consensus that there needs to be a comment clarifying D7 in its scope. In terms of trying to draft that today, uh, my inclination is not to try to do that on the fly right now, but to have um, everyone think about what that language could look like, uh, including over the lunch break, and then um, and then try to to draft something, um, even if it's uh, subject to being further modified by the subcommittee. Put some pen to paper today. Um, 
but I don't I don't know that it's going to be most efficient to do that in this very moment, as opposed to you know talking about some of the other um, language in the revised text. Uh, what, what do what do you what do you all think? I agree that would be the most efficient approach to handle this, um, and I think um, since we have a lot of other issues to talk about, we should maybe move on to the next uh, proposed change um, that we discuss. I'm trying to. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree. And then, you know, um, especially those who have chimed in and have strong feelings about the comment, um, you know, feel free to start noodling around in your own brain or on paper with draft language. And then we can circle back with one another um, after the lunch break and try to put pen to paper and hopefully have some some working thoughts um, to do that. So I, I agree. So well, let's let's um, move to the next um, piece of this, Sarah. I think that makes sense. So I think I wanted to go over next the proposed comment to um, the duty of communication rule. So one point four. Um, so if you could pull that up, Amy. Um, Yeah, so this is to clarify um, that a lawyer's receipt of funds on behalf of a client is a significant relevant um, under the duty of communication, requiring prompt and reasonable communication with the client. Um, and just the subcommittee members discuss this proposed change um, as a whole. I think the majority, if not all of the subcommittee members supported um, adding a clarifying comment. Um, one question raised was whether this should be part of rule 1.15 um, or part of 1.4. Um, one, for instance, the uh, um, rule 1.4.1 dealing with the um, settlement communication rule, that is, is part of the settlement communication rule itself. Um, and there aren't any other examples provided in 1.4 about the duty of communication. And so the subcommittee members question whether we should highlight just this particular one as part of the duty of communication or include it as part of um, rule 1.15 instead as a comment. Um, so that was kind of the overall discussion um, that our committee members had about the proposed um, revision to rule 1.4 to include this comment, which the substance of the comment, I think uh, subcommittee members supported. It was just um, a question of whether it should be part of 1.4 or 1.15. Are there instances in the RPC where there are, where, where an obligation of an attorney is, is described in two separate locations? Because it because it logic I mean here it logically fits in both rules and that's the struggle I'm just wondering how that if that there are other instances of that because I'm struggling to think of any. Well, I mean you could argue that the one point the one point four point one one I think is the example, yeah. um, and I thought, you know I don't one of the I think there's one another one and I'm not it's not coming to my mind now that I remember discussing another example during our subcommittee meeting, and. I don't, I'm not sure what that is, but I think there are other instances where, you know, the duty of communication would, would fall under both rules. Oftentimes I believe it's a cross-reference back to the main rule. Right. Hmm. And, um, you know, on, apropos of that, to echo what I said earlier, I think there is a feeling among the committee that the reference to the example here in this um, revised comment one to rule 1.4 might be better left to rule 1.15. However, the Board of Trustees has asked us to look at adding a comment to 1.4. And so this goes to my point earlier, which is we may or may not agree with that, okay? Um, and, and that's fine. And we can either through public comment or through whatever cover note um, we provide with the, um, the input we provide, make that clear. But for purposes of um, the exercise today, I think 
first and foremost, we'll need to look at how this has been drafted with respect to Rule 1.4, assuming that that is, you know, given the directive we've been given, how the Board of Trustees wants to envision this comment, at least at this point in time, and provide our input with that with that frame of frame of mind. And so, um, what I would uh, invite is um, your collective thoughts on if or how we should edit this red line to comment one, assuming um, that we will be providing the, the comment um, to the Board of Trustees through Rule 1.4 and not 1.15, even though many of us might think that that is a better place for it. So uh, again, I'm, I apologize for being one long-winded, but the gist is, um, what are your thoughts on on this red line and how, how can we better edit it, if at all, um, to improve it, um, assuming it's gonna be here in this uh, comment one to rule one. Well, Justin, and even in keeping with what you're saying, uh, what is wrong or the harm with saying, we think this comment should go in a different place? There's no harm. I'm not suggesting there is. I'm saying that we've been asked to look at what this comment would look like in Rule 1.4, and that's what we're going to do. And in our either our cover note to the the uh, Board of Trustees or in our public comment, we can tell them we don't think that this is the right place for it. If that's our conclusion, but they've asked us to look at it here. And so what we need to do as a first point is to provide our input on what what this looks like as a comment to Rule 1.4. That's, that's the first that's the first thing that we need to do and if we don't agree that that's the right place for it it's a separate discussion and and we're not we're not foreclosing making that point to the board of trustees or via my cover letter or via public comment understood so no one's, yeah what's the i guess mike's question would be what's the downside of having that comment here uh, especially if we also have the cross reference to 1.5 D1. I mean, it may be a little unusual, but I think it addresses the concern uh, the Board of Trustees has on this about communicating receipt of monies. You know, if a lawyer is looking at the communication rule to evaluate what their duties are. Um, this kind of highlights it, that it's a duty. They need to be aware of it. And then they can also look at 1.15. I guess I'm not sure if there's a downside to doing that. Yeah, and, and Ken, that is one point that I think um, I, Randall made too in, in his comment too, that you know attorneys who are looking at just the duty of communication rule then will be alerted to this issue so so that is you know the point you raise is something that um uh, does support its inclusion here um well if randy raised it it's a great point <laughs> <laughs> well why don't why don't you actually say directly that you're cross-referencing it like say something like um this rule um implicates application of other rules such as rule 1.15 i mean i know i know that makes it more prophylactic but um i, I think we already the comment cassidy as i'm reading it we, we are cross-referencing it more than what's currently here are you suggesting another edit right so i'm just saying i'm just saying you know um this rule um triggers other duty you know triggers other um, duties under other rules, you know, I mean, because the duty of communication, you know, it is not exclusive and it will, you know, it should cause you to go to look at other rules more that are more specific to the circumstance. So I'm trying, I, I can't think of like the perfect language, but maybe say more directly the instruction to cross reference, you know, to direct the reader to rule 1.15 as instead of just saying it's an example yeah i 
but you're talking about to direct this the purpose would be to direct the reader to 1.15 or you just is that what yeah you're, no so, that it triggers a duty another an additional duty under one aside from the duty of communication you mean well the duty of communication encompasses the duty under 1.15 a more specific duty to communicate about funds held in you know to notify them of funds in the trust yeah i think yeah i see your point i do think the second sentence too in what's currently already there which is says see also rule 1.15 f which requires notification to be given no later than 14 days after receipt of funds securities or other property and i don't want to get into that particular the 14 day time period here as we're just discussing this general comment. Um, but. Well, okay. I mean, because I agree that it should go in 1.4. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. So I'm just trying to think of ways to say that, you know, 1.4, um, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't solely rely on 1.4 to um, satisfy your duty to communicate. There are other more specific rules that um, you are, you know, required to comply with, you know, which is, for example, rule 1.15. So I'm just saying that there may be a more direct way of saying, uh, there, there's a, a, a way to say that rule one, you know, basically saying that the comic should really go in rule 1.4, you know, because that's, you know, that's the all encompassing duty of communicate rule, you know, and then the more specific narrow rule should be referenced within 1.4, you know, that implicate the duty to communicate. Um, yeah, so I think this kind of relates to, um, <clears throat> a structural issue here, um, which is, you know, how do how do we draft this? What's phrased as an example uh, in the draft uh, to be consistent with how other examples are provided in the um, professional conduct rules. And I was curious about that, and so I did an edit find, and the word example comes up um, twenty nine times in the rules. So um, the comments are apparently full of examples. And the um, most common way that the rules discuss an example is to literally just say, for example, comma. Um, there, was, there was one uh, instance where I saw the rule talk, said, you know, one example of such and such is this. But for the most part, it's a pretty sort of circumscribed structure. You know, it, 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 I haven't seen this phrasing as just one example. It's always been, um, except with a few exceptions, for example. Yeah, and so think, just as a big picture item, you know, one thing I had in my mind is we want to consider drafting this in a way that is then going to be consistent with the rest of the rules providing examples so that it kind of fits in nicely and doesn't get any structural um, pushback. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying it has to be, for example, blah, 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 but um, that would be consistent with um, the other rules. And just to provide some feedback to that point, Justin, um, but this was, I think, the reason that the language as just one example, and I, I don't have all the red lines, um, it's not clear, but I believe that was something that was made in response to the subcommittee's feedback, I don't know if it was I, because there, there was some concern that it, it's not really just 1.15 um, that has a, a duty of, that falls within the duty of communication. There are other examples like the 1.4.1, which require you to communicate promptly with your client. Um, so there are other situations. And uh, the subcommittee is questioning, why are we highlighting just one of those situations here in the duty of communication rule? So I think that is the reason why it's worded as just as just one example to make it clear that it's not intended to be comprehensive. I, I agree that though, for example, doesn't really imply either that it's comprehensive, but I just think that was just a, 
edit made in an attempt to um, really clarify that this is really just one and there, there's other situations. No, I appreciate that. My my comment, I, I, again, I was too wordy um, for a very simple comment, which is, uh, you know, my personal preference is to say, for example, um, just to be consistent with how that phrasing is used throughout the rule. Um, but again, that's super minor. Um, more, more, I think, substantive, um, given that we're just giving a limited example here, um, my reaction was whether or not this uh, addition is overkill. Um, whether we can, we can or want to say this example um, more succinctly, including whether we need or want to include the reference to 1.15F in the way that it's formulated now. Um, is, is this unnecessarily highlighting or elevating 1.15? And maybe that's the intent. Um, but are we good with this formulation, this um, two sentence formulation? Um, do we want it longer, shorter? Is this just right? I think that's um, both a, a wording and a substantive uh, question I have looking at this for, for everyone else. Yeah, uh, I understand your point, Justin. I, I don't necessarily have any concerns with changing it to, for example, I did want to provide a little bit more context for the, the second sentence, um, which that I believe also addresses some of the subcommittee members also had concerns about, um, you know, promptly in 1.15F under the proposed revisions would be 14 days, but that's not real, that promptly under other rules does not mean 14 days or under real 1.4 doesn't necessarily mean 14 days. So I think this was to clarify um, that this 14 days is limited to the 1.15F situation. Um, it's not a, something that applies to other rules. And I also think it also provides a little bit of clarification about if we're, if we're talking about 1.15, um, that, that, what promptly means in, in connection with that rule. But I think that this, this change was really just intended to address the issue and try to avoid confusion that 14 days applies to rule 1.4. But does anyone have any suggested revisions to the language in this comment? Or have a thought on whether we, we really, where, whether we need the second part of it as Justin raised? So, um, you know, again, this is just my personal view. So, you know, whatever. Um, I think it's too, too long. Uh, I always prefer short, comments and you know I, I don't know where this promptly uh, time frame is going to end up um, for us or for the board of trustees or any anyone beyond that so I'm wondering if we can wordsmith this to um, address that and, and maybe avoid the last sentence um, so for instance and I'm, I'm doing this on the fly so I'm sure our people will disagree but um, we could say, uh, as just one example, or for example, a lawyer's receipt of funds on behalf of a client is a significant development requiring communication with the client pursuant to Rule 1.15 D1. And then we don't even have to get into re prompt and reasonable or any of that. But yet we would also we would be addressing I think the issue the concern, which is highlighting that um, 1.15 the communication implicated by 1.15 D um, is a significant development, and that way that this would not then have to be rewordsmithed in the future, if depending on what happens with the use of prompt or promptly in 1.15. I like that suggestion. Me too. Yeah. Uh, 
Justin, are you saying just the reference to 1.15 without any reference to the various subdivisions? I'm not saying that necessarily. Um, I'm open to thoughts on that, but this would avoid the need to have the last sentence, certainly, because we don't have that have this concern about well, what does promptly mean. And uh, but if we want to be a little bit more specific on you know what 1.15 D1 entails, for instance, okay, um, I'm, I'm I'm certainly open to that. But I think the wordsmithing that I've just proposed would allow us to avoid the very last sentence about the whole promptness business. Um, for the reasons I explained, I, I think that might make sense, and it shortens the comment, which I think is also helpful to focus the reader uh, on the point and not get lost in, you know, more words. So um, it, it, I, I'm, I'm very, very open if folks want to wordsmith this further to include some of the language related to either 1.15 D1, as we had here, or, or otherwise. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I support this. I just, I do think it's more concise. And um, I also think it is less likely to cause some sort of confusion. Um, I do like referring to subsection D because that's dealing with the duty to promptly notify as opposed to just referring the reader to the rule generally, which has a lot of different obligations. I, I kind of like referring to 1.15 D and maybe even um, F, which has the 14 day requirement. Um, because if we're going to refer the reader to just D, and they might not, I mean, they should look at the whole rule. But um, since we're talking about that communication duty here, I think we should cite to the relevant subsections that deal with the um, communication duty and the duty to notify. Well, the D1 makes sense. I don't know if we're going to refer to D. Oh, D1, yes, sorry. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. That's what and I. Than how some other one got to, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Well, D1, D4 talks about promptly accounting to the client. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. Um, maybe we would just want to say D because this, this is, I mean, if, if, assuming we agree that all of these shalls under subdivision D, so D1 through D7, implicate a significant development. Um, I guess not all of them relate to communication, right? Like D3 is about maintaining complete records, so that wouldn't really apply. Um, but well, what D4, we're talking about, though, is uh, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. That's off. okay. But D4 is is about a communication, right? Prom promptly accounting. Yeah, D4 um, is talking about accounting, though. I mean, the sentence as it reads now is the receipt of funds. That's D1. Accountings is kind of a separate issue. Uh, I mean, if we just say D generally, it's going to leave it up to, I think, you know, the point seems to be to make, notify the clients of receipt of funds. Yeah. That's what right, which ties to D1. To, and that's what D1 talks about. So and I, I agree. But I still think we should be citing to F as well, which talks about the 14 day um, for notifying the client of the receipt of funds. I think we should, I, I would recommend we cite to both D1 and F here. Yeah, if, F's, if, F, if F is going to survive, I think we have to. Yeah, I guess that's the question. Is it going to survive or not? Um, we don't know, um, which is why I'm, I would say I'm kind of on, more on the fence with citing to F, um, particularly if we're just trying to convey the point about a significant development um, being the lawyer, lawyer's receipt of funds that has to be communicated. But I, I certainly appreciate the reasoning for including F, and so at least for these purposes, which is getting a proposal to the state bar, uh, board of trustees. Um, it's a simple enough edit to remove if they decide to somehow change F. Um, so I think for our purposes, unless folks feel strongly about it, it's, it's fine to include F here for now. Okay. 
at least, you know, from my perspective, I mean, if you look at everything we've just deleted, now what we have here is a real good highlight of the issue, you know, the receipt of funds, and that that's a significant, and letting the, the lawyers who read this know that's a significant development, which I, I think is consistent with the spirit of what we've been asked to um, accomplish here. Um, but again, let me let me ask it one more time because I don't, I don't want to um, lose this thread if we have more thoughts on it. You know, does anyone feel like we need to be more meaty in terms of our explanation here um, about 1.15? Yeah, I, I, I certainly don't. I, I actually prefer the revision, but um, and since I haven't I just paused for a minute, but I wonder if are there any other comments to this language? If not, I'm thinking maybe we should move on to the next uh, proposed revision. Okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm good with moving on and, and we can all digest this over lunch, uh, <laughs> literally. And, uh, and, uh, and then talk about it on our second session. Um, so I think the next um, issue that we should discuss is the, the 14 day time period, um, which is in, I guess it's now in subsection F. Um, it initially was part of D1 um, to Clarify that promptly notify means it must be done no later than 14 days after receipt. And just for some background briefly, um, which is in the outline section 3A, um, some of the subcommittee members um, didn't agree with any sort of um, time limitation, but I, but as Justin mentioned, for purposes of our task here, we are, you know, we're going to assume there is a time limitation. So we should just talk about maybe is 14 days the right time period or there are other changes that should be made um, to sub propose subsection F. But as background, um, you know, the reason that the subcommittee members had concern with the 14 day time period generally um, was just that um, lawyers may wait until the deadline when otherwise it might be reasonable to notify the clients even sooner. Um, the other rules that we're aware of, the ABA and state counterparts don't include a time limitation. Um, most of the other California rules also don't specify a time limitation. Um, and I already mentioned the, first, the final point, which is just that, um, you know, could this cause any confusion because promptly is used in other rules and doesn't, doesn't mean 14 days there. Um, others did think the time limitation would be helpful to include here. Um, so I think going back to the rule, um, maybe if you could, maybe we could just focus on the language that's in subsection F currently and see if anyone has any um, concerns about the language in subsection F or recommended changes to this language. Let, let me throw out a curveball here um, and ask this, do, do we need F? And so here's what I mean by that. Um, let's assume for the sake of discussion that we're presenting to the board a revision with a time limitation since that seems to be what they're interested in. Notwithstanding what we as a committee might think about that time limitation. They want, they want X number of days, okay? So we're gonna draft it like that for their consideration. So if that's the case, why do we need F? Why can't we just put the time the time in D1 and so and, and get rid of promptly there? Why do we don't need to then de define promptly? We can just say within X days, um, the uh, client has to be notified. So we don't need, we don't need F if we just put the, the time in D1. And doesn't that make more sense so that somebody doesn't have to go and find F to figure out what promptly means in D1. You don't have to say promptly, it's all in D1. Within X days, you gotta do this. 
it also it also I'm, avoids that confusion we were worried about where are people going to assume that promptly always means 14 days and you know it, it solves that right i agree right. with that i think that's a great idea yeah and just to clarify his background that's where it initially was in d1 the proposed revision um and i think it was subsequently moved um, to F. And just to provide, looking at the comment in the, that explains a little bit that reasoning, um, trying to pull it up on my screen. Um, just comment ZR2. Um, this is using the approach of a definition. Um, and also that was actually intended to avoid uh, that prompt compliance standard and other rules remains in the status quo. It's, it's only that 14 day requirement only applies in the context of this rule and D1. So that was the reasoning for putting it in F to my, you know, but I, I don't, it seems that others here feel that actually it's, even, it's clearer if it's in D1 um, but I just wanted to explain that background. So moving it to D1 would be consistent with how this originally was drafted. Uh, yeah, that's really helpful background. And, and just to, again, repeat, I, I am not suggesting this is how I would love to draft this thing, okay? We're not working with a clean slate. So I just want to be real clear, like this is not, my the views I'm expressing are not because I think this is the best way, but this is what we've been given. Um, and so, <laughs> Um, you know, with, with that, that's why I suggested, um, but considering omitting F, um, for the reasons we've already discussed, but, uh, you know, please feel free to disagree with me, um, or, or have, uh, further refinements, um, how we can deal with this, um, promptly issue and the 14 day issue. Yeah, I, I would, suggestion. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Cassidy. No, I was just gonna say I disagree with that because I, I agree with you because um, it's already gonna create confusion just by having that in there, and you might as well just make it as clear as possible, um, and then deal directly with the confusion it's already going to create by, you know, dealing with a third party receipt of money and trying to notify that you know, third party within 14 days, for example. Yeah, I was gonna say, I agree too. I mean, just take out take out the promptly in D1. If the, if the goal is to have a time limit, just say what the limit is. You know, no, you know, no event later, within 14 days, you know, you could just say within 14 days, if that's what we want, that just makes it very clear. Um, th does anyone have a devil's advocate approach here uh, that you want to share before we consider making this change? Um, well, on that invitation, I'll throw in my concern that if you're going <laughs> to have a hard deadline, it should be, it should include the language absent good cause. Um, I can't define every excellence, uh, um, incidence that might be good cause, but I'm not as talented as many other attorneys. And uh, they might have many other reasons which could constitute good cause for failing to meet a hard deadline. So, so I think anytime you give a hard deadline, um, it should be absent good cause. And- um, Special circumstances. Yeah, and I also, agree with um, um, the comment that's been made that leaving promptly in encourages attorneys to do it even faster if they can. Not sure if it encourages them to do it faster, but uh, you know, my concern was if we leave promptly in and that causes, you know, and we have to explain that promptly elsewhere doesn't mean 14 days. And I, you know, I, and I, but I agree with your comment, Joel, about uh, the good cause there. I'm not a fan of the uh, 
14 day after receipt hard deadline. I think there's potential problems there. Um, yeah, and Ken, I just want to, I think um, Randall made a good point about the um, 14 day or the promptly, the use of the term promptly. And, and um, I wanted to just raise that, um, which is just that the legislative history could clarify this as well that we're not intending this 14 day time period to apply to, uh, and I'm trying to pull up the comment exactly, but um, you know, that it's not intended to change other existing uses of the word prompt in other rules. Um, and that legislative history um, has been used in the past and there, there's case law on that, that you can use that to kind of help interpret a, a rule or a statute. Um, one other way I, I, I can see dealing with this too, and I do think it makes sense to have everything in, in D1 uh, for the reasons um, others have already mentioned, but you could also clarify that in a comment, but I don't know if it's necessary to, you know, we have a lot of comments already, but that is another way to clarify it. Well, I think under normal rules of statutory interpretation, if you mention promptly with a deadline one place and promptly without it the other place, you don't mean to have a deadline the other place. So I'm not quite so concerned about that. Once again, I guess, what, what does promptly really add to it? I mean, if it's saying no later than, I guess your concern might be that Somebody will wait till the you know the end of you know, but fourteen days isn't very long to start with. If that's the time limit that the that the you know, state bar wants, I this mean, fourteen day is there a presumption that fourteen days equals prompt? I mean, you know, under the circumstances, maybe five days is required. You know, for in the case for it to be prompt, you know. If you're on a two week vacation, yeah. when the money comes in, maybe 14 days. Well, that argument came up in our discussion and somebody pointed out that if you take a vacation, you still have to cover all your professional responsibilities, which I agreed with. So, um, uh, but, and I also agree that adding promptly, uh, there might be a situation where client, um, uh, needs um, mean promptly should be three days. Uh, you got to pay for to close the deal or do something. Right. And so, but absent anything else that makes it prompt, uh, 14 days should be the end of prompt, not the definition of prompt. Right. Um, maybe I'm... <clears throat> I, don't, I hope I'm not starting to pot or misunderstanding something here, but I actually um, liked the, the formulation that's in the red line of D1 promptly, but no later than. But it, because there are situations where it might be appropriate to notify a client, you know, immediately, like in with a matter of hours, they've just gotten thirty million dollars. Then you know what I mean? To to wait fourteen days to tell somebody that you know. Here, your tens of millions of dollars in your favor. That doesn't seem very right or appropriate or what's intended here. On the other hand, as noted, um, does that create a confusion about what promptly means in, in the other uses in this rule? And it's really hard to harmonize what we're trying to accomplish here, um, which I think is to satisfy this interest in a hard deadline. 14 days or whatever it might be, while also acknowledging that there are circumstances where it may not be appropriate to wait until the, you know, the hard deadline. And I guess the question I'm having is whether or not we can um, edit this to accomplish the latter. That is to not just say, here's the hard deadline within 14 days, you have to, um, you know, communicate but also to um, build in with or without using the word prompt, promptly, this concept that there, there might be circumstances um, where it's appropriate to give um, notification 
sooner. And the way that it's formulated with the red line, with it struck, struck, struck out, accomplishes that, right? Except for the fact that it uses the word promptly, which we're all hung up on. And so I don't Probably know. It, why not something like upon receipt, but in no event later than 14 days? That addresses the concern if there's some imminent time issue, um, but it still gives you that 14 day deadline without getting into what promptly means. I, mean, I have some concerns with upon receipt, which, sorry, but because that makes it seem like it has to be like right away upon receipt. And I, I think, I think promptly is a little more flexible and can be applied easily to different factual situations. Um, upon receipt to me implies that it has to be immediate, um, which I, I think is setting a really tough standard. Um, so I, I think promptly is a little bit more reasonable um, and, and flexible to the circumstances, but that's just my Well, my let, let, me, let me push on that. Um, I'm not saying this is the right word, okay? Um, there's, there's smarter people on this Zoom call than me that can figure out a better word, but I appreciate Sarah's comment about upon, and that might be too strict. Following receipt is, I think, a step in the right direction. It's not quite saying promptly, but um, it does imply, again, I, I think we can think of other synonyms um, or, or more precise words, but if we were to say following receipt, but in no event later than such and such days, at least starts to create uh, an implication that there may be circumstances where after you get it and not necessarily right at the deadline, you should be giving notice. So maybe that takes us a step in the right direction. Maybe it's not where we end up, but something like following receipt, but in no uh, event later than um, might be at least get us moving in a direction of something other than just a hard deadline. I like following. I don't know that that um, resolves the the scenario, Justin, that you brought up with like, say there's multi millions of dollars received and say the client is actually waiting on those funds because they have some other obligation, either to pay an obligation, they're trying to close a transaction or something where there's timeliness, you know, time is of the essence. I don't know that following gives any guidance that there's any importance to do it kind of either as soon as possible or as soon as reasonably practicable or like, like you should have, there should be some good reason that you don't do it right away. I 100% agree with you, 100%. That's why I'm saying that I think this is just a starting point um, because you're right. Yeah, and, and I, I understand the, the need to follow your ethical duties while you're on vacation, but does that mean you're a sole practitioner and you need to check, check your bank accounts, uh, you know, balance every hour on the hour or every six hours or every day, or every 24 hours to know when, when it's come in or, you know, what's reasonable under the situation, even if you, even if you put a hard stop at 14 days. Um, if there is some guidance that, you know, there is a timeliness sensitivity issue, not just a 14 day stop, then it would give guidance to someone to know, okay, yeah, I need to check this on a regular basis or when I'm out of the office every 72 hours or every, you know, however much to make sure I'm following my duties. But I think upon receipt puts an onerous burden on people and without any kind of guidance in between, I don't know that there's anything that's really guiding them other than the 14 day hard stop. Uh, one other perspective, and I don't know what the percentage is, but almost all of the receipts into a trust account from third parties go into an IALTA account. The attorney isn't profiting by the delay only the client might be hurt by the delay. So to, to assume an improper motive 
uh, as the driving force behind all this is not necessarily uh, reality in my view, but that's why I would favor something like promptly notify uh, following receipt or absent good cause no later than 14 days gives that kind of flexibility. It protects the client uh, because of the promptly uh, following receipt. And um, uh, I think that does the job without overreaching. I kind of like Elizabeth's comment uh, you know, instead of promptly, as soon as reasonably pr practicable. I mean, because then you're not using the promptly, which is used in other rules, and there wouldn't be confusion as to what it means. And it, you know, it provides some acknowledgement of, you know, circumstances where, it, you know, that takes into account what, what um, you know, the circumstances of the lawyer and the client. Yeah, that, that change would sort of touch on both of my concerns anyway. Uh, this is Randy. If you notice on screen, right in D2, there's the obligation to promptly identify and label securities and properties, and that is aligned with a concept of at the end of that uh, subdivision as soon as practicable. So if you wanted to do the same thing with D1, I think there's already uh, essentially precedent for that. If you think the as soon as practical uh, addresses the concerns that you have that uh, the lawyer's uh, notification should come sooner than 14 days. I think that makes sense. And I think the use of practicable, I don't even know that you need reasonably. I think it's probably kind of redundant and it would cover situations, not just like on vacation, but say, you know, there's a, somebody's in the hospital or someone's family members in the hospital, or, you know, it gives some leeway for um, not lapses in judgment or, 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 responsibility, but just real life practicalities of we're not all sitting on top of our trust accounts 24 um, seven. I, I like that and it's consistent. So they've already have approved that language in that context. Yeah, you know, again, we're, we're not operating in a vacuum and I'm sure all of us feel like by golly, if we were drafting this fresh, it would be, uh, it would look different. Um, but um, given the, the context we find ourselves, I, I, I actually prefer as soon as practicable as opposed to as soon as reasonably practicable um, because lawyers get busy and so it might be reasonable in, you know, at 12 p.m. to contact your client and let them know about the $30 million. But if you gotta go pick up your kid from school and you can't get to them until 3 p.m., you know what? That's practicable. Um, the reasonable thing here, I, I don't. I think it's important to be consistent with the language, and not include that if, if um, we're going to include it in D one. And um, I actually don't think a reasonable test here is is um, as accurate as practicable, given that we're going to have a, a hard deadline in in terms of the number of days that a, that um, a lawyer has um, to to provide the notification. So. Um, I would be I would be okay for considering um, this as a revision that is coupling the as soon as practicable with a hard deadline. Um, if we want to try to draft it D one that way, yeah, I I just have a question because I maybe I just have a different interpretation um, of the promptly versus as soon as practicable. I can, I don't know, in some instances, I think as soon as practicable um, implies even sooner than promptly, even earlier than promptly, because as, as soon as you're, it's, when you look at the definition as practicable, I, I just think capable of being put into practice or, or being done or accomplished, 
you know, technically that could be as soon as you see the funds arrive, you have to do it right away. Yeah. Um, that's what that's a, that's a really fair point. And that's one of the, the challenges of D here is that we have different formulations. I, again, this is not how I think any of us would have drafted it. You've got promptly and as soon as practicable, all within D and what do they mean and how do they differ? It's, it's not clear. And I think that's a really good point you raised, Sarah, that we, we also wouldn't want to be um, heightening the expectations here um, uh, in a way that we don't intend to um, as a result of kind of this um, inconsistent usage of uh, timing in D already. Well, um, why don't Wait. we go oh, ahead? Sorry. I'm sorry, I was on unmute. I prompt, if you look at promptly, it does say immediately. So, you know, <laughs> it, can, they can, it can be interpreted as immediately upon receipt. Um, so those are just my thoughts. We're just looking at synonyms for promptly. One is bang on time, how about that? <laughs> just kidding. Swiftly, it was one, which seems silly. With little or no delay, it's promptly. All right, well, I, I feel like we're a little stuck on this and we might need to think about it a little bit more, but um, we are still um, sort of stuck with the concept of a, a hard deadline. So why don't we, since we have to uh, come to a landing point on that aspect of D1, why don't we talk about that and then we can, um, we can go back so that we can keep moving this forward. Um, well, Justin, before, before you do that, I mean, it seems to me that recognizing we have a deadline um, and we have some competing views on exactly what we should do, shouldn't our communication to the state bar include all of the competing views unless we're unanimous or near unanimous on one particular view on any of these topics? Well, it depends on where we end up, Joel. Um, as I said, I think that it's important for our cover letter to convey that um, you know we're, we've done our best with the direction we've been given. There are different views and to provide constructive feedback to them about those different views, but also you know, there will be an opportunity for public comment on top of that. So um, I'm certainly not uh, against uh, sharing with the board um, the competing views. Um, I think we all, I said would, would draft these um, differently than what um, we're doing here. Um, it's just not the exercise that we've been asked to do. So uh, I, I understand your concern and we'll do what we can in the cover note to address it. Okay, so um, in terms of the number of days, 14 is what's been discussed uh, for the last number of weeks. Um, I guess the real question is, do people have concern about 14 days, do people feel like it should be more, less? Is that just right? Um, again, operating in the world that we are supposed to provide our feedback as to this number of days, even if individually we don't agree with the um, formulation. Well, that gets me back to the absent good cause um, insertion. I think 14 days is quite appropriate um, but then I wonder, what does the state bar prosecutor does or how does the state bar court rule uh, in the case, for instance, of the sole practitioner in a 15-day coma? Right. We're going to talk about the rebuttal of presumption. I promise you, Joel. We'll get there. And whether that's appropriate uh, or not, uh, you know, it's a bit above our pay grade for today's discussion. Is that to say that we're not going to let the Board of Trustees know that's how we feel? No, I'm not saying that at all. But okay. For, for present purposes, you know, let's just operate under the worldview that we're we're to provide our feedback on a, a given number of days that should be stuck in D1. And so the the question is: Is 14 days is that too much, too not enough, or just right in people's view?
I support 14 days. I, I think that is a reasonable time period um, when we're just talking about the duty to notify here. Um, so I, I would I support the 14 days. I support the 14 days. Yeah. You know, any any time period, any fixed time period, you could have issues because if it was 21 days, you could have a 22 day coma. I mean, you know. <laughs> so whenever it's fixed, there's an issue, but I think 14 days is um, totally reasonable. I mean, personally for me, I, I feel like I don't, I'm not, I don't know enough about all the other client trust accounts out there and how lawyers operate to say one way or the other, whether it should be five days, 30 days, 14 days or whatever. And I would hope that the board of trustees would engage in some kind of uh, analysis um, rather than arbitrarily set a number of days. So for me, um, at least what I would plan on conveying in our cover letter is that, um, you know, a number of our um, members are, are comfortable with the proposed 14 days that um, we received in, in the draft that we got. Um, but um, there's not a consensus and seems like a number that should be tied to some kind of uh, analysis that is beyond reasonableness what, standard. Yeah. Yeah, beyond. You know, the, or I'm kind of like Joel with the absent of good cause thing, because it just. Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming back. We I, I had one carrier client that, for reasons we could never understand, liked to wire transfer stuff, but they'd wire transfer it into our client trust account instead of our operating account, you know, our fees and things. And we didn't always get notification right away that this wire transfer had occurred. Um, you would think you would get that within 14 days, but you know, there, I, I could just, I'm troubled by having a hard deadline that has no good cause or exception to it, but. Right. And then, and then 14 days may be reasonable for notification to a client, but I'm not so sure it's reasonable for other persons, you know, I mean, sometimes they're even difficult to identify. Um, that's who a might point. really good point? Oh, that's true. But I mean, I guess there is some control on it based on you know whether there's a willful violation or not. I can't imagine if you're in a coma, that would be deemed a willful violation. But under these other kind of ideas, like Cassidy just brought up, um, I don't know, just kind of vague. Other yeah, I mean, you think about different contexts, but what about a class action? You know, you get a exactly. you get a big settlement in. Yeah. Um, your your oh, clients yeah. are the putative class are the class members, right? Class is certified, so you're they're the class members. So you've got to make sure that you or the uh, claims administrator is given notice to ten thousand people within fourteen days. I mean, really? Um, yeah, not, maybe not they, just, it's not really how a, it, it works in the real world, at least in my experience. But um, so I, I, you know, that's why I think maybe instinctually I've been a little concerned with. 14 days, um, because there are circumstances, um, as everyone else has pointed out, that you know, it, it could be more than 14. And again, this goes into this whole, well, okay, there's a rebuttable presumption, and is that appropriate? And um, again, that's, um, I'm sure we'll discuss it, but it's a little bit beyond our pay grade for today's purposes. But it, it does beg the question, the question presented right now for us is whether 14 days is something that we want to um, say we're comfortable with um, at this point. Justin, wasn't the rebuttable presumption language just for the moment, wasn't it only pertaining to the, to the distribution of funds, not pertaining at all to the prompt notification to D1, just as a point of clarification? I, I think you're right, Toby, yes. Okay. And, and Good point. I just also would like to say that I don't, I, I personally, even though I, I, I'm open to deleting a hard, a hard extant date time period, 
I think that these rules and this rule can't cover every outside circumstance that can occur. Six month comas and all that sort of thing, or even six week comas. And it is not illegitimate or inappropriate to put some sort of boundary on this. And under reasonable circumstances, and I don't know, under reasonable circumstances to assume that most people wouldn't be able to comply with it, even if they're on vacation. Because if you're on vacation and you're a sole practitioner, and I think Dina was the one who made this point in our smaller subcommittee meeting, uh, you make arrangements and you keep on top of certain things. And uh, it just seems to me that it's not an undue burden to have a, a time frame around this. So Toby, what's your thought if, 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 you've, if you've thought about it yet uh, on the, the formulation of a absent good cause um, clarification in, uh, in D1? You know, personally, I leave D1 the way it is and then make a comment if you wanna make a note and saying, you know, if there are extant circumstances such as X, Y, Z, because I think we're gonna to get to a place or at least we did in conversations uh, in, the, in the subcommittee around uh, the presumptive violation. And I'm not gonna be here in the afternoon when we get to that conversation because I, uh, uh, I had a loss that I have to attend to. Um, that, we may get to language or we're not gonna to get to language because I know I'm in quite a bit of a minority here, but I'm just gonna, <laughs> gonna say that um, if there's any desire to look at a change which I, uh, of, of the time frame around distribution, um, the 45 day that's now proposed in there in the language, I think, then, um, and the presumptive violation around it. Personally, the only way I would like to see that would be with, would be with an inclusion of absent good cause in that circumstance. That is, I put it in here in the notes that I sent to someone, you know. You know, while you're looking, Toby, I just want to say that it was the concept of absent good cause, which makes me absolutely uh, got me much more in favor of including a hard deadline. No, I understand. I understand that. I understand that. Um, and, and a shorter hard deadline, too. So that's why the 14 days doesn't offend me as long as you have the uh, opportunity to explain before there's a complaint filed against you what your good cause was. Yeah. And I think that covers- I would, I would vote, I would vote. I think it stands fine the way it is. I would vote for it with absent good fine language, uh, with absent good cause language. Um, but uh, but anyway, so that's, that's where I stand on this one. But uh, I also, just because I am not gonna be here in the afternoon with wanted to be able to say that um, the, that I would promote uh, taking out the presumptive violation language if it is replaced with the failure to distribute undisputed funds within 45 days absent good cause would constitute a violation. And I just wanted to get it in there because I'm not gonna be here to get it. 
dinner <laughs> in the afternoon. Otherwise, I would not. So. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Toby. What was your suggested language? I catch it before you leave. Probably distribute. Well, somebody it, it was in it was in a memo there or something oh, like okay. failure to distribute undisputed funds within forty five days absent good cause will constitute a violation. Okay, I'll find it and I'll put it somewhere. I'll just if it gonna, it. rather than having presumptive violation language in there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're, can I add one thing on this before, you know, because the reason I, I do like this absent good cause after, because this is the language after receipt. Because I, I do have, as I think about it now, I've got another case once again, where funds were wire transferred. Now, technically that's receipt, but it's not in that particular case the, that I'm thinking of, the lawyer didn't know about it until he got a confirmation from the bank. And that wasn't something that automatically occurred. And I'm seeing more and more of these wire transfers of funds nowadays. That's why I like that absent good cause because it's tied to receipt and you might receive it. It might go into your trust account, but you may not know about it until the bank informs you. Yeah, also Ken, I notice when I get a receipt to my trust account, I'll get a notice right away, but it'll say pending. So now I got to wait till I know it's cleared and, you know, receipt of good funds or something, if we're going to go that route. Got it. Um, thank you guys. So listen, we're, we're 10 minutes past the launch hour. So um, you, you can obviously see why we devoted two sessions to this today and we might go uh, two and a half or three sessions. We'll see how it goes. Um, but let's take let's take our uh, lunch break. Um, if we would if we could take a shorter lunch because I think this is uh, an important discussion that we want to conclude today. Um, we could come back at um, one one thirty one thirty five. Um, give us a few more minutes and look at the end of the day. If we haven't reached a perfect consensus on some of these edits, I think we can um, present them in a way to the board where they have the language that we've considered and hopefully in a manner that will be helpful with them. But we can we can talk about that more um, later because at the end of the day, I'd, we'd like to come out of this meeting with some work product um, that can go to the board, even if we don't have perfect consensus on certain things. And so um, we can talk about that uh, in the afternoon, depending on where we are. So let's come back um, 130, 135 and, and continue this discussion. Is there anybody who wants me to circulate this working draft because they plan on drafting some language during lunch or is everybody good? This is Eleanor. Good. I, I'd love to see a copy of it. I'll just send it out to everybody, whoever wants to work on it or come up with some language, then you can, you'll have it. Thanks, Mimi. Okay, no problem. All right, we're back. All right, welcome back everybody. So last we left off, we were discussing uh, <clears throat> Rule 115 and D1 and what we want to do about <clears throat> the time limit that has been proposed of 14 days and how we want to potentially um, clarify um, that time limit with some kind of affirmation that the, the notice can be, should be prompt without necessarily using that word, but also if we're gonna have a, um, a pretty tight turnaround, which at least from my perspective, 14 days might be considered tight, uh, some kind of good cause exception um, built into uh, D1 as, as some proposed language. So um, I'm wondering if anyone had some further refinements to their thoughts uh, on this over the lunch hour that they might want to throw out some proposed language in D1 as we try to find, you know, finalize our draft uh, for today's purposes.
Justin, if there's no other suggestions, I played with it a little bit over the lunch break. And for that uh, particular amendment, you could revise it to state, a lawyer shall absent good cause notify a client or other person no later than fill in the blank uh, days of the receipt and so forth. And the reason for adding the absent good cause is Joel's very good observation about the fact that otherwise this is essentially an, an absolute standard. Yeah. That absolute standard under the existing rule is mitigated by how the term promptly has been interpreted in the case law. When you delete the term promptly and you put in a flat requirement of 14 days, something should replace uh, what the case law has interpreted for promptly. And I think a for good cause, unless there is good cause, is a good substitute for that. And so if you wanted to use that formulation, I think you could uh, use it and you could justify it because you're getting rid of promptly and we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and lose all the, the case law that has interpreted promptly. And so we can maybe recapture that by using Joel's very you know, good suggestion for a good cost standard with respect to this hard deadline of days. I, I think you make a, a very good observation, um, Randall, uh, that, that we wouldn't want this to be um, without exception and absolute. And, um, and so uh, that, that's helpful language. And having thought about it a little more over the lunch hour, I don't feel <clears throat> as strongly that we need some kind of conditional statement that, hey, you need to do this sooner than 14 days. Um, if, if in fact, that's the amount of days that are gonna be selected here, because it is a pretty quick turnaround. And you couple that with a good cost standard, you know, there's a little wiggle room there, but it's also, uh, I think, encouraging lawyers to be prompt without using that word uh, in terms of notification. Um, what, if, what, do, what, do, what do folks think about this? current formulation. Does it make sense to put a comment in there to say, you know, circumstances may require no notice earlier than 14 days? Something to that effect. No. <laughs> I, I no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I, I understand. I understand the the, the thought um, because you're right. I, I think we can all agree that there there might be circumstances out there. Um, I guess to me, it, it, whether it arises to the need for a comment, I'm I'm, I'm on the fence. Um, I'm on the fence. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, Cassidy, I'm I'm wondering if what you're really saying is a standard of care clause as opposed to a. Um, ethical standard disciplinary offense cause. That's a good point. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. Um, because you can, you know, fail to give notice of receipt of funds to the client that could cause damage to the client, which is, re, you know, and you didn't, you weren't reasonable. Um, or other lawyers would have given you know, a reasonable lawyer would have given notice, um, but it may not necessarily be an ethical breach. Uh, I'm not trying to make anything more complicated, but just to like touch touch base on on the high profile case that this seems to be responding to, which um, I just wonder what the contents of the notice have to be, and do, does does anyone have we been invited to talk about that? Because, you know, I've seen lawyers' files where they say, we got your settlement funds. That's literally all they say. Here's a check. But there's no accounting. There's no dollars identified. Do we, or, or are we just making our lives harder by if, if I raise this issue? <laughs> well, that's in um, the, um, what is it, D4 that says shall account. Right. Um, and counting and promptly account in writing. So that's already covered. But well, is that the notice? Is, is the notice an accounting? Or is that 
I, I, don't I, know. Thought, I thought we concluded it wasn't, which is why we didn't include, I mean, why we didn't make the reference to D. Right. Just D, we represent we reference the specific notice subsection, right? Not the accounting subsection. So um I think we've already sort of spoken to that point. Um so it doesn't need to be. I'm just trying to think of the abuses that we're trying to address here. Does the notice need to say how much money is coming or how much, you know, does it have to be specific or is it just, I've received funds? Well, you know, I can see that in the case of a, um, a class action lawyer, lawyer like Girardi, right. uh, accounting to every client for what their share is of and why it is in that amount might be something appropriate, but I think that's not what we've been asked to do here. Um, so uh, promptly account, I think would cover it. And if the client okay. seems unsatisfied, the uh, I think the statutory requirement is that if the the state bar shall investigate or audit the tri the attorney trust account if the client includes that in the state bar complaint. Right. Right. So I think that's kind of covered already. Okay. I'm satisfied. Thanks, guys. Um, any any further wordsmithing that we want to do on this before we? Move on. I'm satisfied. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Before we, uh, I think the next subject would be the rebuttable presumption, presumption but um, I think we should first close the loop on the uh, proposed comment to D7. 115D7, where we talked about a comment that would clarify that D7 um, does not essentially does not include advanced fees or client file. Um, <clears throat> so, um, has anyone had an opportunity to do any wordsmithing, or should we do this a little bit on the fly? And if we're not satisfied, um, by the way, um, even we, we can we can be practical about this and um, either agree that the subcommittee can come up with some draft language for purposes of what we'll ultimately submit or um, you know if we're unable to do that to leave some kind of placeholder so that we flagged for the board of trustees that in our you know we think a comment is necessary here but um, in the time that we have if we if we can do some some ed, some um, you know some drafting here. I don't think this needs to be a terribly complicated um, comment, and uh, I'd invite your thoughts as to what how we might want to word this. What it, it to kind of address Joel's concern about like testamentary, testamentary documents, things of that nature, kind of the way we have it right here, the subparagraph D seven is not intended to apply to advance fees, comma client file, or any other property that the client wants the uh, attorney to retain possession of something along those lines you know, that that would cover what Joel was talking about. Um. I don't know that uh, you want to put the the client wants the lawyer to keep possession of that requires mind reading, but I think advance fees, client file, or other property entrusted to the attorney by the client is really what we're trying to say. In other words, stuff that doesn't come from a third party.
Should it be non-monetary property? Well, I think once you say advanced fees, client file, or other property, that other property gives you the whole universe. Other than settlement <laughs> funds, basically. I guess I guess so. That's that's kind of fine tuning it, but if we yeah. want to clarify that we could, but I don't know that it's necessary really. Or it just may say it, this this applies only to funds received or funds of property received from a third party. Yeah. Also well, going back to this, this this last phrase, any other property, I mean. Does that only include, as someone said, non-monetary property? Is that the qualification that we want to make? Or is it sort of in, in between this and what Bill proposed, which is basically property that the client has requested the lawyer to, um, to keep or maintain? So that it's not just what the client wants, but it's affirmatively something, some property that the client has asked the lawyer to be entrusted with. Well, I don't. I like entrusted as opposed to requested because normally you get an advanced deposit, and it comes with no instructions, other than I'm going to do legal work for you. Thanks for the money. Uh, that'll cover it. And the client's giving you no instructions to what you do if, um, say, a, a hiatus occurs in the case. Like maybe the parties are talking individually and it might settle later and they don't give you any instructions what to do with it. Um, you, the, 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 the client has not then requested you to hold it for that additional period of time or that possible contingency or whatever. I just think that what we're talking about here is if the Girardi case is what the problem is we're trying to solve, that all involve funds received from third parties. So uh, I don't think just, I don't think we wanna make it contingent upon a specific client request, hold that money until I tell you different. Okay, but a property entrusted to the lawyer interpreted broadly could include the settlement funds that the lawyer gets, right, from a settlement. So my, so, my, the other part of my comment was a question is, do we need to clarify what kind of property we're talking about here um, to either be non-monetary property or property that isn't um, the subject of the Girardi issue, which is settlement funds, so that this um, entrusted language is not um, overbroad? Well, I don't think non-monetary clarifies it. I think what we're really saying is that anything that the lawyer receives from a third party in which the client may have an interest is what um, is going to trigger all of these prompt notice requirements, not property that has been entrusted to um, the lawyer by the client themselves. Now, I don't know if that goes too far by saying it's only third party receipt. But that seems to me to be the difference between the two, not whether it's monetary or non-monetary. Okay, so you're saying this, the phrase entrusted to the lawyer by the client is sufficiently clear so as not to encompass, say, you know, settlement funds. That, yeah. that should be distributed. Unless you interpret entrusted by the client to mean um, entrusted by a third party for the benefit of the client, which I don't think you can torture it to read, that does it. Yeah, no, I, I, I well, see what you're saying. Couldn't, couldn't the client arguably direct it to an escrow or something like that? I mean. I don't, I'm not so sure that's clear. I guess I would think the client allowing it to be paid into the lawyer's account could be, could meet that standard of entrusted to the lawyer by the client. 
right. I don't think I heard that. Could I have that repeated, please? Sure. I. It, my point is, I think if a client allows the money to be paid to the lawyer's account, couldn't couldn't that be interpreted as entrusting it? When there are other options. Well, technically, um, you could make that argument, but I think that it. I think that would be stretching it. And what we're talking about is, okay, the, the lawyer receives money from the third party. Um, that's when you have to promptly notify the client that it's there. At that point, the client may say, well, why don't you hold it? Because I've got to resolve a tax issue. Now it's been entrusted by the client. Um, just the fact that the receipt of funds is going to be deposited into the attorney's trust account by virtue of a settlement until uh, you know all the signatures are received or something else doesn't mean that that's what the, the client has entrusted to the lawyer in terms of the funds. That means they're coming from a third party. That's the source. If the... Oh, the concern here is because what Joel raised earlier was, you know, the the wills and that sort of thing, which I thought we said we meant but we included within client file. But if that's the concern, why don't we just say advance fees, client file, or any documents entrusted to the lawyer by the client? That way we don't get into funds and other types of properties and well, well, but that doesn't ha cover Joel's point about the client directing the lawyer, the, the lawyer to keep the settlement funds, you know, but what, what if you say um, any other property that is directly entrusted that the client, <laughs> I had it in my head, that uh, basically- Kathy, the, Can I suggest something? Yeah. How about uh, advance fees, client file, or any other property from the client entrusted to the lawyer. What about directly entrusted? Okay. <laughs> Cause I think otherwise it's indirect as far as it being entrusted by a yeah. third party through a third party. <sighs> or something <laughs> entrusted directly. I mean, so if this takes me back to Bill's um, original formulation um, with, with uh, there being some kind of action by the client making a request of some kind to the lawyer to hold on to something. So take the example that Joel gave, you know, the, the settlement money's come in and the client says, ah, hold on, hold on to the money. I'm not ready for you to distribute it. I gotta deal with the tax issue, right? So in that example as well, client has done something affirmative, making some kind of request uh, for the for the lawyer to hold on to it. And that would apply equally to say a will, you know, the, the client says, hey, thanks for preparing this will, hold on to it for me. Okay, well, there's been a request. And that seems to be the sort of prerequisite to falling within this clause, as I'm understanding what we mean by this, this clause. So the, and I think I think it was Cassidy. Sorry if I have that wrong. But the whole the piece about directly, I think, is implying the same thing that the client has taken some made some affirmative request of the client to hold on to the what we're calling the other property. Is is that right? And if so, do we want to just say that or any other property um, that the client has requested the lawyer to keep or maintain or something like that? I like that. That's clear. So we don't, so entrusted is not um, the right word. Oh, no, I'm okay with it. Or it could be um, any other property that the client has asked the lawyer to, um, I mean, keep, keep or maintains easier to uh, reformulate than uh, to be entrusted with. I guess the way that I'm <laughs> thinking of it, it just doesn't sound as smooth. Um, but my, my, my hang up is not entrusted. It's not that word. It just doesn't work as well with 
what I'm doing in my own brain. Well, then, then how about keep or maintain in trust? Because the whole yeah, point is you're not going to keep it in your general account. You're not going to keep it in your closet. You're going to maintain it in trust. That's, I think that's good. Yeah. Does it, but doesn't that maybe give confusion with trust accounting or <laughs> wills aren't going to be you know something that's trust accounted true or, yeah. or, or for safekeeping or something or something. keep me keep or uh, <laughs> i mean i'm not a wills and trust lawyer so i mean maybe someone with that experience yeah if you have it I mean, is that what wills and trust folks, lawyers do? They, they safeguard? No, where, they where, don't. Where they I mean, where there's they probate. Use? Yeah, there's probate codes that govern that, and they have to be. They're they're like, it's like a bail, is it bailment? But there's there's specific statutory um, provisions that um, allow a lawyer to hold instruments, you know, originals, um, but it has to, it has to follow that statute. Otherwise, you know, they they typically um don't agree to keep originals or or, or um, official in instruments so either they are keeping it or they aren't but if they are keeping it they have to follow the particular probate code section i think it's probate code sections um so that gets into a whole other kind of body of law that's specific to trust and estates what, what if you say uh the client has asked the lawyer to maintain for safekeeping well, does it matter? I guess that's what I'm asking. Does it matter why the, the client is asked? Whether it's for safekeeping or because the client, you know, it, that is a hoarder and doesn't have room in his or her house and would lose the document or who knows why? I mean, um, does it, I guess, does it matter for purposes of our formulation? I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I'm just asking the question. Yeah, I don't think it matters. I just think I agree with Ken, though. I think trust can can be mis misconstrued to mean trust account. Yeah. So I think if you just cut it off after uh, ask the lawyer to keep or maintain, maybe that's all you need. <clears throat> I see. So that there would be no. You don't have to provide the reason. Or the location. Other than the statute, as you point out, Cassidy. <laughs> I think we need to say either the client file or client files. Anybody have a preference? Well, because fees is plural, you might want to say files. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Files. Yeah. Regarding advance fees, I, I think other places in Rule 1.15 refer to it as a fee paid in advance, singular. Nope. Uh, 115B, for example. Fee paid, fee paid in advance, singular? Uh, that's what it, okay. how it's phrased in 1.15B. Then change it to the client file. Or an A fee paid in advance, the fee paid in advance, A fee. All right. And just, just again, to uh, hopefully alleviate some concerns folks might have, um, at least from my perspective, we're doing the best we can with the time we had. I think if we will want to flag in our, our cover note to the Board of Trustees that we've endeavored to provide some um, proposed language for this comment. By no means has this been, you know, vetted over the course of multiple sessions uh, and so on. Um, but we've done our best. So I, I think we'll, we'll, it's important for us to caveat this so that they know where they might want to spend more time and attention because of the limited time we've had. But I think that overall, this is a pretty good, you know, for an initial formulation here. Um, this is pretty good. Um, does anyone have any further edits before we get to the topic that we've all been waiting for, the rebuttable presumption? 
is it from that the client? I think there might be a little bit of uh, extra word or uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, any other property that the client has asked the lawyer. Any other property? Yeah. That the client has asked the lawyer. Yeah. That client has asked the lawyer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there is the the option as well to since sort of the larger context of this is uh, facilitating compliance and prevention, there are provisions in Rule 1.16, uh, specifically E1 and 2, that are the provisions that apply to um, release of a client file, that's E1, and the refunding of any uh, part of a fee uh, paid in advance, that's E2. Uh, would it make sense to cross-reference those there so that when you're uh, informing the lawyer that those obligations uh, under uh, D7 uh, don't apply, that you're not leaving them in sort of a vacuum, that there are uh, other places in the rules that are more specific to the topic of releasing to the client a file and uh, refunds of advance fees. I think the cross-reference makes good sense, um, and I'm glad you thought of that since we're trying to do this on the fly. I appreciate that. Uh, does anyone have a concern about the cross-reference? Not about the cross-reference, but just style. Might it be easier to say keep or maintain consistent with rules 1.16 E2 and 1.16 E1 or reverse that, whatever. But I can live with it either way. Yeah, I guess the challenge I have with that is um, the last clause, any other property doesn't really tie to those two rules. Okay. Got it. All right. Yeah, um, so I think the, the next place we're going to go in our discussion is the um, rebuttable presumption. Uh, just real quick, did we resolve what we were going to do with this 45 days thing? Are we going with without absent good cause there? Or does that, is that no longer necessary? I don't even know where we left it off. I put it in as something we had discussed, but I don't know if it was. Oh, uh, that was probably my confusion. The, the good cause discussion was actually um, a, related to the D1. Okay. So we, we, we reformulated D1, if I have my numbering correctly, uh, to have the good cause. So if, if that got put there uh, in, in comment five, that, that I don't think belongs there. Well, it was more of from the outline um, under, what section is this, 3C, we recommend removal of proposed comment four, which is now comment five, to subsection F, which would create a presumed violation if funds are not distributed within 45 days. And I think we were gonna add something about a cause thing, is that? <laughs> so I think this is this is going to be one of the, the topics that we will be uh, discussing right now. Okay. Again, yeah. Just want to make sure that we didn't miss it. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think this okay. is one of the challenge challenges we have, Mimi, because uh, particularly with the rebuttable presumption. Maybe I use this as the segue here. I think some of us feel strongly that this is not um, the best route to go and yep. would like to see a different standard, whether it's a good cost standard or the burden of proof not shifted or whatever the case may be. But again, uh, particularly for this one, let's keep in mind that um, you know, we've been asked to provide our input in a certain framework. And so we just have to be mindful of that. That's not to say we shouldn't have a discussion or debate about whether this is appropriate, but at the same time, to the extent we're working within a certain framework um, that, that is not our own, we'll, we'll just have to um, you know, be pragmatic about the changes that we propose and 
and how we convey them, um, particularly, again, um, expecting that our cover note or public comment will be another avenue for us to share our um, differences of opinion to the extent we have any with the rebuttable presumption. So um, with that, I, I, we, Sarah dropped off and Dina is obviously not able to be with us today. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna stand in as best I can here to uh, introduce the subjects, but I would especially invite those who are on the subcommittee to <coughs> weigh in and help lead the discussion here because uh, I wasn't part of this subcommittee. Um, so I think we are at, uh, is it comment five, Mimi, where the rebuttable presumption is, or four? Uh, formerly comment four, now it is comment five. I'll just put this all on one screen so it's just easier to read. Okay. So um, as I understand this current formulation, um, one of the changes, I, I think, to soften the rebuttable presumption from the, the original draft we got at the last meeting, and, and please correct me if I have this wrong, um, for those of you who are on the subcommittee, is that there's now a, a, a statement about the lawyer's reasonable determination that the funds held by the lawyer are undisputed as a way to sort of soften this um, aspect of the rebuttable presumption. And uh, I know that that doesn't necessarily uh, appease those of you who, who feel like this is not appropriate or that there should be a good cause or, or some other standard. Um, <clears throat> So I'll just open the floor um, again, uh, particularly inviting the subcommittee members as to what you think um, of this current formulation and how we can improve it, particularly if we're working within the, the rebuttable presumption framework. Um, wait, what was what was the softening language you just said, Justin? I what, well, and, and, and Brandy or someone can, can tell me if I have this wrong, but this um, at line 371, where it talks about the lawyer's reasonable determination that the funds held by the lawyer are undisputed. I don't recall that being in the original um, version. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that it occurs to me, though, that the lawyer could reasonably determine that it's undisputed, but that wouldn't answer the question of what do we do about tax purposes or other requests to the client or um, what do you do about a, for instance, a settlement that provides that the client, um, uh, that, well, the whole settlement's got to cover all the client's medical liens and you haven't heard from one of the medical providers and how do you determine if they dispute it or not within 45 days? You wanna let sleeping dogs lie? I, I'm just sort of rattling off of supposes. I'm not, uh, and so that's why I don't think that the reasonable determination is the, uh, the key. I think that good cause or the absence of good cause is the key language. And I'm mindful Randall, the, the letter that you sent and I responded to about that is that, okay, the OTC um, will investigate good cause before filing. And I don't doubt the good faith of the OTC. However, I thought back to my own experiences after I went ahead and wrote the, my response, I thought further is that, you know, I became a, a special deputy um, about 13 years ago when Jim Towery asked me to do it. And so I did it and I went to training, uh, full day training. And then I uh, investigated or prosecuted over two dozen cases under the watchful eye of four, I think, separate um, special deputy administrators. And um, <coughs> someone said then, oh, gee, you know, you haven't been there in a while. Why don't you get some more training? And probably because I needed some extra CLE credits, I said, okay, I took the training again. I noticed uh, that there were some differences in the procedures. And thinking back on that, it says to me what the state bar says their procedure is in the OTC 
five years from now, after there's been a, a, an 80 percent turnover in that office and changes in procedures and training, um, what that what they said five years ago isn't going to be enforceable. What's going to be in this rule that's published is what's going to be relied on and enforceable. And that's why I think we have to include it actually in the comment and not just leave it to the, the good graces of the OTC uh, as uh, honest and straightforward as they are um, to, oh yeah, we investigate that. And the experience that uh, we had when uh, April of 2018, when we all had to get fingerprinted and there was a couple of hundred or more attorneys who had to have opened against them a, um, a, uh, a state bar proceeding where essentially they had to prove that some 20 year old conviction did not involve um, moral turpitude. The burden was placed on them. And while that was pending, their state bar record said disciplinary action pending. And I don't know what the final statistic was, but how many of those people were able to establish that the failed to report prior conviction had nothing to do with moral turpitude, uh, but I'm sure it affected some. In the meantime, they've had to have action proceedings. So it would have been better. And I heard that the, uh, they actually changed the um, the automatic referral rule because of that is that it requires now the state bar to conduct some investigation um, to determine if it does involve moral turpitude rather than the other way around. And I thought that in this case, because there might be some pretty good reasons, and again, I can't think of them all, but there might be um, some pretty good reasons why that 40 day deadline might be missed it ought to say something like uh, uh, the lawyer or law firm uh, will uh, undisputed property or funds uh, absent good cause must be distributed to the client within 45 days. And um, that would then put the burden on the, the state bar to prove, and I think that's where the burden should be, that there was no good cause, and thus it is a willful disciplinary offense that they can prove by clear and convincing evidence before they charge. So um, having not to make a good cause investigation or determination before charging uh, leaves open that possibility that future procedures might change because this rule doesn't have a good cause requirement as a predicate to filing. So that's my major concern. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, let me, let me, uh, <clears throat> this is for Joel or anyone else, but um, are, are, you, are you in favor of both the language about absent good cause and this lawyer's reasonable determination standard that's in here, or do you see those as um, sort of alternative approaches to the standard that would apply here? Well, I think um, good cause could determine the absence of a reasonable ability to make a reasonable determination of funds. So good cause covers that, and that's unnecessary. Also, it's possible that you could make a reasonable determination that the funds uh, are not uh, disputed, but you still have good cause not to do it. So I think just leaving it at absent good cause is better than throwing in the additional language about reasonable determination that they're undisputed. Because the, it actually says undisputed funds. So somebody is going to have to determine that they were undisputed and the attorney is going to be put to the burden of saying, no, 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 they're not. And that's their good cause. So um, I, don't, I think that other language, the second phrase is unnecessary and might even create some confusion. 
I, I agree with Joel in that regard. I, mean, I think I'd cut it off after it says within 45 days and I'd put a period, just cut the rest of that sentence out. <clears throat> well, so let's talk about that. Um, and, you know, I'm a civil litigator, so my perception of burdens and standards of proof might be different than those of you who uh, are working with the state bar. Um, so when I think of lawyers' reasonable determination, that sounds like a pretty good standard if I'm a lawyer in this situation. They're going to be, look, you know, test is whether I was reasonable. And boy, I, you know, if I'm if I'm deciding whether to um, distribute funds or not, I'm I'm pretty comfortable. I'm going to be reasonable in making that determination. Um, so that sounds like a good standard for a lawyer. Good cause um, seems to me to more put the be more objective in this regard, and somebody else is going to decide whether I acted with good cause. So is that? If I'm the lawyer in the situation where somebody's looking at whether I distributed funds, would I want to be subject to a good cost standard that somebody else is going to determine or be in the situation where it's just it's about whether I was reasonable and I have the chance to uh, explain myself um, and it's about whether my determination was reasonable. Um, I, one could make the argument that the, the reasonable determination language is um, less onerous for a lawyer who has to defend himself or herself in this situation. Now, could somebody make a different argument about that? Yeah, sure. I, I can see somebody, a clever, a clever person on this committee flipping it and saying, no, Justin, you have it backwards. But that's why I raise it. You know, what the the the, the overarching question is what are these what do these standards actually mean? Are they objective? Are they subjective? Do we care um, in this context? And I just wanted to throw that out there into the COPRAC universe because, you know, at least to me, we, we might be conflating different standards um, here, good cause and reasonable determination if we were to keep both. And so I understand the proposal is to remove one of them. Um, the question for me is, well, which one? Uh, and then also, could, could we harmonize these two in the same sentence? I, I'm not, I, that might be a challenge is what I'm saying. Uh, I'd love to hear from what other people think about that. To be to playing devil's advocate, I get the, the concern I have with that phrase in the context of within 45 days of uh, a lawyer's reasonable determination that the funds held are undisputed. Well, when does that clock start? I mean, so it could be, well, it's been 90 days and the lawyer says, well, I think they're now, they're not disputed. So now, the client has to wait at, you know, they go to the full deadline, now 135 days uh, uh, before they get their funds. So that, that's, the, that's my, the concern I have with that, the way it's phrased at least. I don't necessarily disagree with, you know, using a reason, kind of a reasonable person standard, um, I think is certainly favorable for the lawyers, but I think the concern, and, and obviously I don't know the Girardi case as well, but um, it just seems like that could be, I mean, it could be a year before a client gets funds. I mean, you know, so that, that would be the concern I have with that, using that phrase. That's a great point. Whatever we do, I think we need to clarify when the 45 day clock begins to run. And I think the intent, to tell us if we have this wrong, Randall, the intent is 45 days of receipt of the funds is the intended timing. Is that right? Well, there were two ways in which the rule has been uh, formulated. One is a longer time frame, you know, maybe 60 days, but within that 60 day time frame, it is on uh, the lawyer's uh, duty and responsibility to uh, clear any obstacles to uh, the client's entitlement. So one formulation of this is that there is an absolute 60-day period, and within that period, the lawyer has to be diligent to get the funds out by resolving liens and other uh, issues concerning the entitlement uh, to the funds. 
there's another formulation where the rule has a shorter period of time, which I think is the current version in front of you, 45 days, where the clock only starts ticking when the funds become undisputed. And so there's a definition in this current version of what constitutes undisputed funds. And once those funds fall into the category of undisputed, which is the reasonable determination aspect, uh, then that shorter period runs because if the funds fit the definition of undisputed, then all of the lien issues and other obstacles to the clients or other person's entitlement have fallen away. So there's really been those two ways of implementing a, a rebuttal presumption concept. Um, I don't think there is one or another that um, is believed to be the better one. And so that is something that um, COPRA can consider in terms of uh, developing uh, a rebuttable presumption. Well, that, that, that's helpful, thank you. You know, Justin, I, I didn't consider, uh, and I appreciate, I, I didn't really think about, okay, lawyer's reasonable determination. And then I put on my prosecutor hat and I'm going now, what does that mean I have to prove? That by clear and convincing evidence, I have to prove that the lawyer's determinative process was unreasonable. And that, as you, I think, said, conflates the two standards. Um, also, isn't there uh, somewhere in here we also say that if there is a dispute, you've got to promptly seek to have it resolved by the appropriate process. And then I'm recalling, I don't want to speak for Toby, but uh, she wanted an even shorter Time frame than 45 days. Um, and that's what led us to our good cause discussion, and um, which is where we kind of came out, reducing it from 60 to 45 and adding the good cause that you, you know. But I'm troubled with the lawyer's reasonable determination. Um, I'm Girardi, and I say, hey, um, I mean, I heard some of his excuses. <laughs> okay, he made them sound reasonable, but uh, it, you know, how unreasonable does it have to be versus a clear and convincing standard? That's what I struggle with. Uh, let me just mention that I, I think the term reasonable is, is used for that language because it is a defined uh, word in 1.0.1, the terminology rule. And so reasonable okay. or reasonable. Didn't have an asterisk. Yeah. You know, when used in relation to conduct by a lawyer, such as determining if funds are undisputed, means the conduct of a reasonably prudent and competent lawyer. So it, it does sort of... Um, align with a, a more of an objective standard. Mm -hmm. But that it, it still raises the question of when the clock starts, um, what Bill was mentioning. I think I would be more in favor of an, a longer period running from the date of receipt and giving you know 60 days or whatever it is for the lawyer to resolve disputes, but then exclude say that the rule doesn't apply to interpleader actions when the fun, when when now it's before a court to to resolve the dispute and they have no control over the timing you know the time it takes to actually resolve the dispute so you know you got to be diligent and doing all you can before you go to court and if you still can't resolve it then you can go to court and you're not held to that 60 day rule Well, but that doesn't, that's triggered when you can't reasonably determine it. Not when you can reasonably determine it. And then once there's a dispute, say it's the um, um, 
a, um, a successor attorney in a contingent fee case where the first attorney says they're entitled to a certain portion of it. Now, you know it's disputed and you immediately got to go and seek the appropriate resolution. And it isn't just interpleader. It's, um, you know, in, uh, bringing an action on behalf of the client, um, uh, mandatory fee arbitration. There's all kinds of ways to resolve that. So I don't, I, I, I'm not comfortable with getting specific as to one exclusion, but. Or like formal, pro right, you're right. I mean, it's not just interpleader. It would have to be a, a lien claim, you know, a, an independent claim to 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 um, pursue the lien by the predecessor counsel or something. Um, yeah. But but any formal process, you know, I mean, I think, aren't they getting at you? You need to do something to informally clear out the obstacles. And when you can't do that, you got it. I mean, you have to go to court some in some way or, you know, arbitration or whatever it is, but you need to seek, uh, you know, a, a neutral body to resolve the dispute. Well, but then let me ask you, I mean, what if, again, in my hypothetical, the second attorney determines that the first attorney's uh, claim is absolutely unreasonable. So I make a reasonable <laughs> determination that there's no dispute. So, but then the case is frivolous, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, which is why I don't know that I'm having my struggle is the significance of the lawyer's reasonable determination being the trigger for anything. Right. So, me too. That's why you take out, you know, that's why you, you give you, that's why the, the time. The trigger should be from the date of receipt with a longer period in which they can make a reasonable determination, resolve disputes, whatever. And then if they can't, then, you know, if that 60 day, if that six, I, I get, well, I guess what happens at that 60 day point and they haven't resolved the disputes, are they, they, do they have to go to court or do they just distribute the money? Well, I have to throw a wrinkle in here, but I'm also thinking about, I mean, what about, because we're talking about lien claims and other, what about when you got multiple clients and they may disagree the allocation of the settlement funds? I mean, I've seen situations like that that take longer than 45 days, sometimes take longer than 60 days. Right, and you don't want to file a lawsuit over that. Yeah, and you, you, you know, interpleading the, your client funds, you're filing a lawsuit, you know, I mean, when there's a dispute between two clients is problematic. Uh, just one other wrinkle to throw into the analysis here. Well, then you have to get consent from the clients to, you know, how to resolve it and how, you know, and, and or and consent to extend. Can you get consent to extend? The 45 day rule? Is that, is there something in there that says, yeah, absent a, re a request from the client? So you can request that the client's request um, an extension. What if, one, what if one says, yeah, right. I'll extend, the other says, no, I won't. I won't. I haven't entitled this and I want it now. Well, then you have to go to litigation, right? I mean, you know, what else are you supposed to do? I mean, that kind of is the end game there. Well, um, Unless you have it, you know, that's why you put it in your fee agreement, you know, how things are going to be, who's who's going to be the primary, um, who's going to give primary instructions, which client. But that's that's kind of why we settled in on actually agreeing to the shorter timeline, because all those things you're talking about might constitute good cause for why it didn't happen within 45 days. But you want the shortest possible time for the attorney to have written letters to everybody that they're supposed to and say, here's how I'm gonna distribute it. Is there a dispute? So yeah. it, then you shouldn't have to have the lawyer ponder over it. Is it reasonable? Is this dispute reasonable? Whatever. No, in 45 days, it's either distributable or it's disputed. Yeah, but from when? That's the, con the, the problem I has is when does the 45 days begin to run? Well, didn't it used to say receipt or something? Yeah. Well, 
I don't have a problem with that. You've got funds. You notified the client under the 15 day or 14 day rule. And now you've got to notify everybody else and determine if there's a dispute or not and distribute unless there's a dispute. So then that means you take out the reasonable determination language and keep absent good cause. Yeah, but, that's yeah. the way I do it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't have any, yeah. I mean, I think that's basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but, so I just, just want to see if I understand. Are, are, you, are you suggesting that we would change this so that um, the formulation is within X number of days, a lawyer has to distribute the funds uh, if there's no dispute about those funds? That's what it says, undisputed funds. So in other words, you get funds into your account. You got to send those out unless you know there's a dispute. Not that you've determined that there will be no dispute or there is no dispute. You got to some. You got to know, absent knowing there's a dispute, you got to kick it out in 45 days. Now, your good cause could be all kinds of things. Like your client might say, there might be a dispute. I want you to hold it or uh, the client, uh, you know, whatever. But in a shorter period of time, you got to kick it out unless you've got good reason not to do it. You got good cause for some reason not to do it. And if you say, well, we were expecting this dispute or whatever, well, then did you follow the other rule that says, all right, you've got to promptly seek uh, appropriate resolution. So that you, you didn't have good cause because you didn't seek the appropriate resolution. So I don't think that the lawyer is the one who should be the judge or jury of a dispute. Once anybody makes any claim for a dispute, you've got a dispute, then you got to have it referred to prompt resolution. And if nobody uh, refers to any dispute, you got to give it out. 45 days. So the client can go uh, to a cruise once we get to take them again. So any claim, any claim, even if it's based on you know thin air, to the to the funds, you would classify as disputed. Well, sure. I mean, it's, so there's no contract, there's no legal right to it, there's no lien. I mean, so, you know, if some, some random third party said, I heard, I heard you got, you know, there was a settlement and I'm, you know, a beneficiary to the plaintiff's estate, so I, I have a claim to that. Well, and, that's, what courts are, that's what courts are for. Yeah, now, but I've had so many situations. I mean, money, knowing that there's even a frivolous claim so that, that doesn't that doesn't prevent a lawsuit. So that means that every time for recovering yeah, the money. Yeah, but I've had situations where that situations like that where you know the lawyer, the lawyer then has to hold the money in trust and then go to court over over a a, a nonsense claim without and then not distributing it to the client. I mean, well, at the very least, um, the lawyer well, warned the client that that's a possibility, and the um, the client could instruct it to uh, distribute, and then the third party may bring a state bar complaint saying you didn't have good cause, and somebody would determine whether the determination of frivolousness was good cause enough to distribute away from this third party claimant and to the client. So yeah, that's what courts are for. That's what mandatory fee arbitration is for. That's what interpleader is for. Yeah. I just think there's too many standards. 
that are imposed in this rule here. But yeah, no, I, I, I'm struggling with that as well. And because um, <clears throat> we have the good cause standard, we've got the lawyer's reasonable determination standard. I was looking just at uh, the related provision in uh, <clears throat> where to go in what was H, which talks about the lawyer, what the lawyer knows or reasonably should know. Uh, yeah, reason knows or reasonably should know. And we got the reasonable determination standard again in G. So we got three different standards related to this rebuttable presumption. <laughs> right? What was, what was Listen. wrong? I mean, I mean, B7 as it was written, I don't know what was wrong with that. Promptly distribute any undisputed funds in the possession of the lawyer or law firm that the client's entitled to receive. When we start adding all this other stuff, but you know, 45 days promptly, I mean, there's all sorts of, I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure there's all sorts of state bar decisions defining what's promptly that, you know, there's, I've seen them that says, you know, 30 days wasn't prompt or, you know. Yeah, um, two weeks. Um, I guess it seems like we're, if this is just going to unnecessarily complicate it and create a trap for people, when there was already a rule that said promptly distribute if it's undisputed. I mean, look, Ken, that, that makes perfect sense. I think a lot of us share that concern. If we're able to today, our goal is to try and massage the language before us to present our input about this rebuttable presumption language to the extent that the Board of Trustees wants to pursue it. And, and we're struggling, I think, because, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, um, but including that, you know, there are some, that this needs to be done logically. It needs, the provisions need to be parallel <laughs> and not have free standards. And um, look, you know, it's, it's something new and something we're concerned about. And so I think we're all kind of reacting to that. But that being said, um, given where we find ourselves trying to come up with this language, I'm still not entirely clear um, where the consensus is on what the formulation should be. Um, it sounds like the most recent formulation, and please, if I have this wrong, please, please correct me, is we're thinking that it, it would be something along the lines of um, you got to distribute the funds um, absent good cause within 45 days uh, of the lawyer knowing or should know that these funds are not disputed, which is essentially what we have in, in, in what we're looking at on the screen. I mean, has this, has this, am I missing something? Has something changed that we want to revise this to? Other than maybe uh, the reasonable determination language, are we are we kind of coming to this being the landing place for purposes of today? I mean, if, just to throw a wrench into it, I mean, what we went over with D one in terms of four D and day and having promptly and having the two in there, and we decided to get rid of promptly and say absent good cause, you got to let the client know within fourteen days. Isn't that the same problem we have here with D7? When you look at this comment, this comment is as drafted by or proposed by the, the board is imposing now a 45 day standard. Now, is that gonna create confusion because other subdivisions of, of this rule have promptly as well without, without any days? I mean, we run into that same problem. So wouldn't it be easier if, if we're fine with an absent good cause or reasonable term, whatever we want to recommend, have that time limit in the actual text of the rule itself? You know, for D7, say, um, 
you shall distribute within, you know, absent good cause within 45 days, everything else. And then, you know, you don't run into that confusion. And then you really don't even need that comment if you have that. I mean, you have the comment, the next comment that talks about undisputed funds where you can put in, you know, the issues about liens and whatnot as, as it's alleged. Seems to me that a recommendation would be to consider adding the language to D7, adding the 45 day language and the absent good cause in the text of D7 and get rid of that comment altogether, leaving the, you know, what's undisputed property and funds. And you kind of almost eliminate that problem. That makes perfect sense, Bill. And in the, in the ideal world here, we would have had more time to formulate this. What we're doing today is, um, a challenge. We normally we're a very deliberative body, and we normally have more time. Um, and, and so, I, I totally appreciate what you're saying, and, and, and um, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm just trying to triage where we find ourselves um, in thinking out loud. And I don't know if this works with with the rules, but could we do, you know, after one five one d seven? Does it make sense? To have instead of G and H these kind of standalone sections of subdivisions, would it make more sense, for instance, for G to become seven little I and for H to become seven double I um, so that they're all in one place um, and, and not this kind of hodgepodge of cross referencing within the same um, rule? Particularly since we're trying to emphasize this this new requirement of you better distribute or you're going to be subject to a rebuttable presumption. Does it make more sense to organize it together like that? Um, I don't know if that's consistent with what you're thinking, Bill, um, or if that would even be practical from a drafting perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that makes sense to me. Um, I was just thinking in terms of almost, com, you know, compacting it all into D1, or D7, excuse me. Uh, I mean, maybe those are better, maybe those are best, um, I was gonna say maybe they're better for a comment, but I think it's important to know what undisputed funds and property are for purposes of that rule, so there's no confusion. So mm -hmm. I, I, I like your approach. I mean, I think that's one, certainly something we should look at. But if you go back and read what we're talking about, where is it? Um, okay, stop. Establish a presumption that absent a request from a client or other person that the lawyer not distribute the funds held by the lawyer or the law firm, that's how you know there's a dispute. So if you don't get that request from anybody, there's no dispute for the lawyer to reasonably determine. If you do get that dispute from one or more of the parties, then it's not the lawyer's job to adjudicate that dispute. And in fact, they're holding funds in trust for everybody who's a, uh, as an escrow holder in essence, um, and it's not their job to resolve that dispute, make the determination. And in fact, they might have a conflict of interest because their first duty is to their client not to an adverse possibly third party. So I don't think the reasonable determination is what needs to be in there. You don't have to further define what's disputed. All you need is one or the other or more of the parties to say, don't distribute, it's mine. Okay. Couple of, uh, so we're focusing on this comment five, right? Because comment, comment five, go ahead. Yeah, comment five. Well, first of all, comment five refers to paragraph F, which is the 14 day one, not the 45 day. It's actually paragraph G. And G's got all that in there already. The lawyer's reasonable determination. 
So I'm, I guess I'm not clear on the whole point of the comment because the comment seems to essentially be repeating what G says. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you're right. I think that's right. I mean, it's providing a bit in an example. The, the comment provides an example, but- um, That's the only you know, difference, yeah. From my perspective, that example is it's kind of um, obvious. So I don't know that it adds much. And again, if we're trying to highlight the rebuttable presumption for the, for the lawyer, it's obviously more than just a comment, right? It's part of the rule. Um, so sure, um, we, we, we may not need the comment, um, but we would still need to um, formulate what is currently G yeah. uh, <laughs> in a way that, that we're uh, satisfied with. So I, I think that's- uh, yeah. Ken, uh, I'm not so sure that, because uh, I know all of our discussions were at the subcommittee level were directed to the 45 day rule. So I think the reference to F on line now 368 really meant it to be uh, the 45 day rule, not the 14 day rule. Because I don't recall ever discussing a rebuttable presumption with respect to the 14 day rule. Well, yeah, no, that's what <laughs> I understood. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was just a misreference to F instead of G. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's, what got, that's what got me looking at more closely at G, and G essentially says what the comment says, except for the example. Although I'll put it out there that I don't even know if we're going to keep F anymore. Are we still keeping F? Because didn't we get rid of promptly notify in D7? Am I wrong? Uh, no, I think you're, I think you're me? right, Mimi. I think yeah, you're D1 right. D1 promptly notifies gone. So technically we don't need this, which means it'll still be F. Yay. Was go. FR addition or, or the boards? That was the boards. Yeah, it technically would go like this. This would become F and then therefore um, this would become G. And now we are back to F in <laughs> here. And all is right in the world. Okay. So it's, it's, it strikes me the real issue then is that language in G or F or whatever, it is, <laughs> you know, yeah. which gets us back to that whole reasonable determination issue. Well, um, I don't know if this is going to move the ball forward, but let me let me try. Let me give it a shot. Because um, I'm looking at the language in H, which, talk, which talks about knows or reasonably should know. Um, would a standard in G that that tracks that be better? You know, we can put the good cause language in and then say. It shall constitute a presumed violation for a lawyer to fail to distribute funds or property within uh, 45 days, uh, in which the, uh, or 45 days after the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the funds or property um, are undisputed. What you know? Yeah, and since what I'm thinking, we have to put in the absent good cause language in F too. Well, H or whatever it is, I mean, that defines what undisputed property is. So why not just say, shall distribute the funds, shall distribute undisputed funds or property within 45 days? Because H describes, H is the whole definition of yeah. what undisputed funds is. And then put in the absent good cause. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So wait. <laughs> uh, I Maybe you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the after the knows a reason we should know. Is did I put it in the right place? Here, Ken. Why don't you direct direct so that we're not all talking at Mimi? Uh, where is the reason we should? Oh, oh, I see. Here we go. I pulled that from over here. That's a request, my client. Probably should help. No, I, I just think we, you know, what line 289 now, 
yeah. shall constitute a presumed violation for a lawyer to fail to distribute undisputed funds or property within 45 days. And then the next section describes what undisputed property is and has all the provisos and... Are we keeping the rest of everything that happens after 45 days? Well, we can keep what a presumed violation means. So that's if we want to do that. But so you want to delete all this then? That's what I think. I think we need to clarify what 45 days with of what? 45 yeah. days of receipt? Well, 45 undisputed property. Well, because the next one describes what undisputed property is. Right, but it, once you've reached that undisputed property point, then you got 45 days. Within 45 days of what occurring? It being undisputed property. Oh, but see, now we're back to where we were. <laughs> of determine that then it becomes after 45 the 45 days of determining that the property is undisputed. That's what you're trying to say. Undisputed property, okay, H says, or G, whatever, undisputed property refers to funds or property when the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the ownership, so that's all defined right there, that, that's a defined term, so if we put the little asterisk or whatever next to undisputed property, or undisputed, or we can say undisputed as set forth in subsection H. No, because you... Um... Well, I mean, I don't think that the, the, the discussion here is whether it's considered undisputed funds. I'm thinking what people are trying to say is we say within 45 days, and if we delete this highlighted section, then we don't know within 45 days of what happening. And so... But that's what H says. No, no. Well, why don't you put within 45 days of the 14-day notice? Because, you, you know... You've got two time periods running together, the 14 days and the 45 days if it's upon receipt, right? So maybe. No. I think, are you trying to say within 45 days of the lawyer knowing or reasonably should knowing that the funds or property have become fixed and there are no unresolved issues? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm getting. I mean, the question, the key fact in this pattern here is that it's undisputed funds or property. If it's undisputed funds or property, you got 45 days or it's a presumed violation. And then G, uh, what's now G, defines what undisputed funds or property is. So when you read the two, you've got you've, uh, that H sets forth the time period and G explains what undisputed property is. So the time period is 45 days from the date the funds become undisputed. Undisputed. And then H describes what undisputed is. I still think it's vague. I think we can't just end the sentence here is all I'm saying. We need to put yeah. something here. Even if we're pulling from what the definition is, we need to put something here. Yeah. Well, you so, can see the lawyer's reasonable determination is set forth in subsection H below or, or G or whatever it is. Because that's tied, because that was a concern I had before is the two weren't necessarily tied together and creating different standards. Understood. Can we pick one or the other? Well, the reasonable determination is subsumed within the definition of undisputed funds of property. So you, I think it, it makes sense to say within 45 days of the date the funds become, quote, undisputed. As or, defined or, by subdivision G. Subdivision G, yeah. Yeah. That works. I still think it's going to be hard to calculate. Well, two, two <laughs> things two things I might just say about that. Number one, um, I'd still like to see an absent good cause in the yes. day rule. But secondly, thinking about it, when the attorney receives funds and gives the notice, or even before they give the notice, they may have absolutely no reason to know there's a dispute. Right. 
So the 45 days will start running from the date of receipt. And then uh, 25 days into it, there'll be a dispute. And now the attorney knows again that they are disputed. It's yeah. They're disputed, then they doesn't have to dis disperse them. Yeah, which is why- It's gotta be, yeah, it's, it's gotta be like 45, it's there and there's gotta it's gotta be 45 days like a total 45 days of no dispute like it's like it's like it needs to be flipped you know because there's you, you don't know when the funds are going to become disputed and you'll you you'll only know that within the 45 days so you can't it i don't know, it just it <laughs> sorry <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense to me um how this will be calculated based based on you know the definition of of disputed or undisputed. Hey, Randy, I assume these will go out for public comment, or am I wrong? Uh, they would definitely go out for public comment. Because I, I, I would hazard a guess that this is going to generate a ton of public comment. Yes. <laughs> you know, what what uh, the committee is wrestling right now is something that currently is addressed in the case law under the concept in D7 of entitlement to receive. And so the current duties of a lawyer, of course, would be as to any funds in their possession, if the client is quote unquote entitled to receive them, then the trigger promptly distribute is applicable. Uh, what uh, the interest uh, that the board has in exploring is, can we promote compliance and prevent harm to clients by giving more information to lawyers in order to comply with this current standard, promptly distribute something that the client or the person is entitled to receive by putting more flesh on the bones. And so in terms of what is promptly, you have the concept of a rebuttal presumption of X number of days. In terms of entitled to receive, there's this idea of it not being disputed and not being the subject of a request that the, uh, from the client or other person that the lawyer not disputed. And so the, the concept <laughs> is to promote clarity and assist the lawyer to comply. Um, because right now you have the ambiguity that presently exists with regard to how promptly is prompt to distribute and when do a lawyer know that the funds are funds uh, that the person is entitled to receive? You'd need to pour over the case law to determine, well, in this case, 30 days was prompt, but it, in the other case, it wasn't. You'd have to pour over the case law to say, well, the entitlement to receive uh, in this case uh, was not present because the client did not come in to sign the, the release dismissal. And so, Part of this exercise is to try to again be more proactive in uh, regulating the conduct of lawyers so as to promote compliance, um, avoid harm in the first instance. And hopefully when you have things like a longer definition in G that describes examples of things, I mean, doesn't just say, you know, interpleader, it's like any litigation that might cloud the entitlement it uh, takes you out of the the uh 45 or whatever time frame but these things are supposed to help there be uh, a meeting of the minds between a potential respondent attorney and octc in the same way that the advertising standards um previously assisted uh enforcement staff and respondents to figure out if something was false, deceptive, or misleading. And so, again, that's sort of the broader context of this. And, you know, what you're struggling with uh, is, is not you. It's, it's, it's in the concept of entitlement to receive right now and in the concept of promptly distribute, uh, which is the operative uh, trigger in, in, in seven, the requirement. Anyway, but... Um, well, no, Randall, that, that as, then I, I've got a question, which is what research was done to determine if the 60 day original suggestion was supported by some uh, experience with that's usually how long it reasonably takes for all of these things to settle out in a multi-party settlement or a personal injury 
you know, with medical liens is what, what was the magic of 60 days? And if it was, um, um, I don't want to say scientifically, but if it was based on evidence, maybe that's the best thing is to say, yeah, that's reasonable because that gives the attorney 60 days to figure out if there's a dispute or not. And if they don't, they better have some darn good cause for why they didn't. Yeah, I don't think there's any magic as to, to the days. And again, there were two concepts of this that came out of the discussion by the uh, special audit committee. It was either a, a longer period, and during that period, the lawyer would be uh, required to diligently seek to re resolve any disputes so that the funds could be distributed by the end of that longer period. Um, or it would be a shorter period because the start uh, of the clock would only be upon uh, the funds being characterized as undisputed. And so there, there really was two ways to approach it. And they, they did have some cases presented to them at their meeting, um, but they're all fact specific, of course. So you couldn't really say, you know, one case, you know, might say 30 days, another case might say something else, but it's all dependent on the surrounding circumstances, mm -hmm. which is why this presumption is uh, rebuttable as opposed to conclusive, and which is why it doesn't even um, get triggered uh, under this formulation uh, if the funds are disputed or if the client has said, you know, hold on to it. Well, you know, put that way, I've got no problem with 45 days from receipt, which is basically, basically to figure out if there's a dispute and if there is none to distribute and if there is one to initiate some proceeding to resolve it. Unless you've got a good reason why you didn't. Well, so um, guys, I'm looking at the clock three o'clock and we still have got other items that we need to get to, including with respect to these trust issues. Um, my inclination is to, um, you know, unless there are some further edits to be made here on this rebuttable presumption is to flag in our cover letter to the state bar uh, board of trustees that we've made some good efforts here, but we don't, by no means do we think that this is, you know, the conclusive formulation, but we've tried to give them some input and, and to express to them, here are some of the issues we've been working through. We haven't resolved them and flag that for them. So they, they know that we've, we've really been working hard on this, but, but that this needs further thought because I don't think we're going to resolve these issues today. It's not our job to resolve these issues today. Um, um, but it is our issue, to, uh, but it is our obligation, I think, to issue spot and, and make our, our best efforts. And I think we're going to do both. So unless there are some real specific additions to F right now, um, I want to I want to move on to another issue related to the rebuttable presumption. Okay. So um, Toby made a proposal, which is reflected in footnote five. If we could go there. Um, towards the end. Wait, what? Five. Note? Comment five. Not oh. no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Civil litigator here. Um, comment five. Um, the the last portion here. The side. This concept that um, it's not good enough for the lawyer to just sit around and hope that the funds become undisputed, but rather the the lawyer has an obligation to take diligent steps try to resolve any issues that are holding up distribution. And so um, I think we discussed that maybe we don't need much of this comment five now because it's already in uh, F and G or G and H, but uh, what about keeping this concept at the end here that Toby proposed? See, uh, you know, I have my thoughts on it, but I wanna open the floor to um, what you all think about um, highlighting in the comment that uh, a lawyer should be taking those diligent steps to try to clear the issues so that the distribution can happen.
Are we good with that? I like keeping that in there. I like it a lot too, actually. I'm just wondering if we should say a lawyer's duty to take diligent steps. Just... But I think it's useful. That's that's my inclination as well. It's a good it's a good reminder to the the lawyers um, that they can't just sit on the funds. That you know they should be taking steps to to clear issues, and it's consistent with um, what we're trying to uh, do here, which is to ensure prompt distribution. So um, then the question becomes, well, what do we do with the rest of the comment five? Uh, I think that uh, as, as Ken I think astutely noted that first. Half of comment five is, is already, you know, within the, the text of the rule. So I don't know that we need it. And then it becomes a question of whether we need the example. Um, you know, again, to me, the example is helpful, but it's somewhat obvious. And um, I'm talking about the example at line 371, and it doesn't necessarily flow if we remove the first part of this comment five, which I just said uh, um, is kind of already subsumed in the text of the rule. Um, as we've revised it. So I'm wondering, subject to your input, if we just start comment five at um, the, the last sentence, this, in, uh, excuse me. I see, uh, it might need to um, start at the, set, the penultimate sentence, although the rebuttable presumption and then um, the this includes statement uh, or something along those lines, but basically remove the first half of this comment and then some, and then foreground uh, Toby, Toby's good thought about, how, about um, the lawyer's duty to take diligence steps or something like that. And uh, you know, looking at this, that second to last sentence might need a little massaging, but, but conceptually, I mean, what do you think about about this approach? Um, yeah, I, I think there's a about a 10, 12 year old Koprak opinion, which says almost exactly that. Um, so I've got no problem with it. We might even want to cross reference that um, if it's in a comment, uh, cross reference that opinion. Um, and as far as removing the stuff before that, as long as Absent good cause gets up into the rule. I'm okay with it. Okay. Um, why don't we go back up to the rule? Uh, what was it? F or G? I can't remember. <laughs> All right. And so, uh, <clears throat> where, where in F, Joel, are you proposing we stick the absent good cause if we were to include that? Uh, it also constitutes a presumed violation of for the lawyer, comma, absent good cause, comma. To fail. Ken, is that consistent with what you've been thinking? Or are you uh, not a proponent of the good cause clause that no, I'm fine with the good cause, that addition right there. Okay. All right. And you know, again, I think that's that's a phrase that we'll, we'll flag in our cover note to the board, let them know that we've been kind of tinkering with that um, formulation and, and something for them to, to think about further. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just checking my notes to see if there's any um, other aspects of this that we need to cover oh, today. Uh, One thing, uh, Justin, I'm, I don't want to be a pain in the rear, although I am. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't read through the rebuttable presumption re re uh, references to the evidence code there. I'd want to track that through. I don't even know that that last sentence is necessary at all, because you've added the good cause standard as a pre prerequisite to bringing um, your case to begin with. So you're going to have to prove absent good cause. 
Yeah, so this is the last piece I wanted to talk about today before we um, discuss how we're going to package this. Um, and, and Sarah asked me to share some of her thoughts on the burden of proof issue. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in her mind, it's somewhat unclear how the rebuttable presumption or would be rebutted and what standard would apply. You know, is it going to be clear and convincing? Should it be preponderance? And, you know, I think that the memo touches on some of the constitutional due process issues that some members um, raised with if it's intended to be a, both a rebuttable presumption and the burden of proof is clear and convincing evidence on the lawyer um, in order to basically avoid potential loss of, of license. And so there were some concerns there. Um, now, uh, that I guess ties into the burden of proof issue in evidence code 605 and 606, um, where the rebuttable presumption is, I guess, implicated. Um, how, it, I don't have a good answer <laughs> for uh, Joel's question or Sarah's concern, other than to say that this is the formulation that's been proposed. Uh, and, and just in my own mind, I'm not sure how we would revise it in light of the fact that it is so specific to the evidence code statutes. Uh, I, I welcome any creative thoughts here. Uh, and I appreciate that many of you have probably a concern about this rebuttable presumption and tying it to the burden of proof in those evidence code provisions. But given our direction today, you know, I'm not really sure how we can creatively maneuver this, but I'm, I'm open to your thoughts. Well, in my view, and I discussed that with Sarah and the committee, the subcommittee, I mean, is that once you arrive at the concept of the burden of proof is on the state bar to prove by clear and convincing evidence that the lawyer had no good cause to fail to distribute these funds within the 45 day deadline, you don't need any further language about what the evidence says about shifting the burden of proof. It's all there. You're not putting it on the lawyer to have to prove they're innocent. You're still leaving the burden of proof on the state bar to prove that the lawyer, by clear and convincing evidence, that the lawyer acted in the absence of good cause. That's all you need to say. Well, you're, if I'm understanding you right, you, 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 you would like to see it, the, the burden be on the state bar, right? It is. I can't remember the exact section, but the, the requirement for a conviction of a disciplinary offense is by clear and convincing evidence. And so, so that's what the state bar should have in mind when they charge, not be able to rely upon a presumption that would um, might be relevant in a state bar proceeding to mitigation, but it's not, shouldn't be relevant. The presumption shouldn't create the violation. The state bar has the burden of proving by clear and convincing evidence that there's been a violation. And so I think this up to the state bar to have to prove that the failure to meet the 45 day deadline was in the absence of good cause. And if they can do that, they've got a violation and the attorney can say all they want about mitigation under the mitigation uh, section after conviction. But to shift over to the attorney to have to prove that I acted in good cause, even though I missed the um, um, uh, 45 days, uh, and bear that burden of proof, then you got to get into, okay, what burden of proof does it shift to the attorney? Does it shift to the attorney the obligation to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they acted in good cause? That seems pretty unfair. So that's why I had real trouble with it. And I was satisfied if we put it in as a element of the charge that the state bar be able to prove by clear and convincing evidence the absence of good cause for failure to meet the deadline. You don't need any rebuttable presumption. You don't need any shifting of the burden of proof. And you don't have to argue about what standard then does the attorney have to prove to prove their innocence. 
Okay. Uh, I missed the deadline because I had a, a reason. What's my burden of proof? Reasonable evidence? Clear and convincing evidence? Preponderance of evidence? No, I, I, I think that takes away from the state bar what is a statutory obligation of proving a violation by clear and convincing evidence. It's up to the state bar. I agree with Joel. I mean, I, I think with that absent good cause that we added, that that last sentence uh, is superfluous, is, is not necessary. So, so, <laughs> but in effect, shall consume. Okay, but but you. So let's let's just assume for discussion, we cut that sentence line two ninety one to two ninety three. What about you? You're, you're, you would be good, Joel and Bill, with the statement at two eighty nine, that. Um, where it says shall constitute a presumed violation absent good cause, you're good with that language. If we cut the last sentence of that paragraph that starts a presumed violation means. Yeah. You could leave it in there, but it's irrelevant because it doesn't show up. You don't get there until they've also proved absence of good cause. Right. Sure, but then let me play a devil's advocate. Uh, I don't think it, it's doesn't, yeah, I don't think doesn't it have to have a definition of presumed violation so that the lawyer understands what, what that phrase means. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think you would you would I would take out the presumed before violation in, in 289 to be if if of course we were gonna the recommendation is to take out uh, uh, the statement on 290. 291 to 293. If you take that sentence out, then that would take out the presumed in front of violation in, in um, line 289. Just to well, be clear. Let me, let me play devil's advocate. Wouldn't that be a, a hard, could, couldn't that be construed as a harsher standard for the lawyer? Because it's saying that there is a violation as opposed to presumed violation, which implies that it can be rebutted. No, but well, if, if, they, if they don't have good cause, then it, it is a violation. So, I mean, that, that's where that's the fluff is, is the absent good cause. If, if the state bar can, if the Office of Trial Counsel can prove there was no good cause as part of its case in chief, they prove that by clear and convincing evidence, then the lawyers, he violated, he violated the rule or she violated the rule. Yeah, the question then that the state bar court is going to ask is, has the state bar met its burden of proof that there was no good cause for this, rather than has the attorney met the attorney's burden of proof that they had good cause? So, um, I understand. Let me, let me uh, ask Randall to chime in here, because um, my understanding is that these Board of Trustees is looking for language that includes the rebuttable presumption. And so while we might in our note to them, inform them of our suggestion that they consider removing the word presumed at line 289 and the phrase and definition of presumed violation, um, they, have, they have asked to have that language in, in whatever, um, draft they get from us. Is, is that your understanding, Rand, Randall? Yeah, I think um, there's nothing that would prevent COPRAC from having a version that includes presumed violation and the evidence code's reference to what it means. That was the reference and continues to be the reference that the Supreme Court has approved with regard to advertising standards and presumed violations of the advertising rule. It refers to those uh, same evidence code sections. So if you wanted to embrace the concept of rebuttable presumed violation, then you would leave those words in, in the evidence code citations. But there's nothing that doesn't, that does not also mean that you couldn't provide an alternative version 
that eliminates the presumed violation reference and the citation to the evidence code and add your pros and cons for why an absent good cause uh, standard would be equally effective for the, again, this broader context of proactive regulation to try to um, uh, facilitate uh, compliance by greater information about how to uh, comply with duties, et cetera. And so if the language, for example, in G uh, gives that information and helps lawyers comply sufficiently so that the presumed violation and the evidence codes references are necessary, then you know that's the the argument you can make. I, I want to be completely candid though and say, I do think they were actually looking for a burden shifting concept. Um, they were not uh, satisfied with the status quo of the state bar having the normal burden of proof. They were looking for an actual shifting of the burden of proof, and it, it well, is not unprecedented. I think. Um, Kata Yoon has done some good research for us. She's found a Wisconsin rule. She's found, uh, since then, I think she's even found, is it the Arizona rule? An Arizona yes, rule. Yes. And they all involve uh, presumed violations of, of trust accounting violations. So those are out there. And I, and I think the Chief Trial Counsel did also mention that they've been operating for a long time with the case law presumption that when a balance in a trust account falls below the balance that a lawyer ought to have, that that is a basis for finding culpability of a misappropriation uh, charge. And so there's presumed misappropriation when the balance in a trust account falls below what ought to be in that trust account. And so, again, there, there are presumptions uh, out there. I think the board is interested in exploring a presumption. But that doesn't mean you couldn't come up with an alternative that you can make a case for that would, again, achieve uh, the same goals without uh, adding this new presumption. Randall, uh, as I said in my, my letter back, um, I had no problem with the presumed violation that when your trust account falls below the required balance, because now you're talking about funds that are missing um, and they're unprotected. But if it's just failure to distribute funds that are still in the trust account, those funds are accounted for somewhere. Uh, they're in the trust account still. And as far as the presumed violations in the advertising rules, a lot of research went into those like eight point print or whatever it is, is a presumed violation and failure to translate the, the contract into the advertised language is a presumed violation. You know, uh, 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 get, talking to people or giving them papers in an excited state is a presumed violation. Some research went into each one of those examples. No research has gone into this, and they're rushing us to, to adopt a standard, which I think would have to be changed by statutory action, um, without that kind of consideration of what are all the possible causes or good causes uh, or bad causes for what happens in a trust account. If they want that from us, they should do more, give us more time. They haven't. So I'm not going to sit here and say, uh, stand by, that they're going to say, well, Coprac, you know, looked at this, they're good with it, uh, and be a potted palm and endorse a change that there's a presumed violation merely because you meet this 45-day deadline when I can think of a, several reasons that haven't been thoroughly researched, why it might have good cause to it. And I, if you're, I'm sounding pissed off, you're right. So. All right, so thank you, Joel. We, I think a lot of people uh, share your um, frustration and sentiment, but, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be helpful to the, to the board, even if we don't necessarily agree with the current um, iterations personally. So here, here's what I think we need to do because we need to move on. Um, we're gonna, I think we need to leave, my proposal would be we leave this as is with both um, concepts included, including the good cause concept and the language that we understand the board of trustees 
wants to see. And in our cover note, we will be very, very clear, um, as, as Randall noted with respect to pros and cons and what um, the views have, that have been expressed um, regarding these provisions are. And again, I, I think it's important for us to, to emphasize that we've done this as expeditiously silly as possible. This is not uh, an endorsement by COPRAC, at least not at this point, and that we're, uh, we'll continue to be a resource um, for the bar as they um, <clears throat> look at, at revising this rule, including uh, I think many of us will individually provide public comment, and we may indeed provide public comment as a as a committee. So um, this is not the last word on what this is going to look like for many of us, and nobody is asking anyone on this committee to endorse um, what we've worked on today. But I think we've made good progress. I think we've been helpful to the Board of Trustees. And again, we're going to have a cover note that's going to go with this that I uh, would like the subcommittee to work on. I hope that that will be a cathartic opportunity for Joel and others to um, to kind of share their two cents, um, you know, as this gets finalized. So, so here's what I here's what I would propose to the committee. Um, I think that um, that what we have formulated today, subject to any um, you know. Uh, what, relatively minor edits that the subcommittee might need to make in order to make this um, work product presentable to the Board of Trustees. Um, that, that work will be performed by the subcommittee, um, including highlighting some of the alternative language like an F that we just discussed. So we'll, we'll package the, this into work product that we're comfortable um, providing to the Board of Trustees and I think it also makes sense for the subcommittee um, to work on a, um, a letter consistent with the pros and cons and concerns that have been raised today to then be disseminated with our work product to the Board of Trustees, um, expressing our kind of, here's the lay of the land, here, here are our concerns. Um, and that um, we would vote to approve that um, as the next step so that um, the work product and our cover note can be provided to the Board of Trustees in the um, timeline that they've requested, which I understand is uh, sometime prior to our next meeting. So, so again, I would, I would, I would you know, move that um, the, we approve this work product uh, these draft rules subject to revisions being made consistent with our discussions today and to um, get this in a presentable way to the board plus preparation of a, a cover note um, be approved by the committee um, to be completed um, to meet the deadline of the board of trustees. Um, can I just make one note? We had discussed maybe moving F and G as little I under seven, which is not substantive, but maybe that's something that subcommittee can consider when cleaning this up later. Or is that something you think that the committee needs to discuss? I'm good with the subcommittee. Taking Wait. that on. Okay, cool. Just making sure. So that was your motion, Justin? That's my motion. Okay, cool. I so second. the motion, who seconded it? Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, we have a second um, to approve this rule to be further refined or cleaned up by the subcommittee and submitted to the board for public comment circulation. I will go ahead and take the vote. And, okay. and, and preparation of a letter. Yes, and the memo. Know, yes. Accompanying the proposed rule with alternative uh, language and or concepts to be considered How about that okay that's fine justin yes ken bacon as a non-potted plant yes <laughs> sarah Bonola, elizabeth bradley yes cassidy chivers yes toby inlander brandon krieger yes joel mark 
I approve the motion to the extent that uh, I vote in favor of reporting to the state bar where we are and offering to be a continuing resource, but I will abstain as to the content of that communication. Okay. Um, Eleanor Mercado? Yes. Bill Munoz? Yes. Kyla Rowe and Hunter Starr. Okay. The motion carries. Great. And um, Randall and Mimi, do you, do you know offhand what the deadline for our submission is as requested by the board? So the board is meeting uh, in March. I believe it's <clears throat> March 25th. Uh, their agenda would be posted 10 days before then, but we would probably need it at least a week before that uh, in order to uh, incorporate it into the actual broader agenda item that it will be a part of. Um, okay, so by early March, basically. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, sometime uh, next week, I'll, I'll touch base with um, Sarah and Dina, because I know that they've been a um, uh, uh, helpful part of the subcommittee and um, get on the same page with them. And, and um, we'll follow up with you, Randall and Mimi, about, uh, about the timing. So um, thank you, everybody. That was, a, that was an intense, uh, helpful conversation that we just had. I really appreciate it. I know that's this is reminding me of the good old days when I was uh, a first and second year Co-Proc member, and we would literally spend like three hours talking about one paragraph in an opinion. And uh, but here we actually we we went through even more in, in, in a substantive way. So that was very productive. So um, appreciate that. Um, why don't we just take a three-minute break, stretch our legs, and come back 335, 336. And then um, Brandon, if you're if you're ready to roll, I'd like to talk about the contingency uh, conversion clause opinion next sounds good sounds good okay, okay. thanks okay we're good all right uh so something other than uh trust rules uh hopefully uh breath of fresh air here for all of us um so brandon we we've anxiously been waiting for several meetings to be able to talk about your opinion. Uh, so I'm glad uh, we're here. Um, maybe you could um, walk us through uh, some of the major changes and, and um, uh, it sounded like you, from reading it, there are some questions you wanna raise with the um, committee members and then we can talk about it. Yeah, um, the basic changes. So, so Joel and Ken and I have been talking about this over the past couple months and we have sort of made it a little bit more rigid taken a little bolder stand that uh conversion clauses are just unlikely to ever pass muster um and we had some ideas along that line one of them just for the committee to think about was to have just a statement of the of the law uh you know the the our 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 conclusions based upon the burdens that conversion clauses can place upon the client's right to terminate counsel and upon the client's right to determine whether or not to settle and actually not even have the scenarios because what we have found is that we have five scenarios and it's just four different, the first four are just different ways of us saying you can't do this. And the fifth one is so unusual and anomalous and built up with protections and unusual circumstances it designed to make it pass muster and we still have some reservations about it that we're wondering if this opinion might be more useful without the scenarios and we wanted to see what people think of that um you know we've been trying to figure out a scenario where a conversion clause that would purport to entitle an attorney to more than a quantum merit fee if the attorney is terminated would ever be ethically permissible. And we're not leaning that direction. I mean, we just aren't seeing it. Um, so so that's that's sort of, you know, we've, we've gotten a little more strident in our view and want to see what the committee as a whole thinks about it. So we're not getting out over our skis too far. Thanks. 
Well, um, <clears throat> let me just open it up. Uh, does anyone have any reaction to uh, Brandon's questions about whether to keep the fact patterns or whether there are situations uh, where a lawyer could recover more than quantum merit uh, in, in this factual context or, or any other comments about the current draft? Um, I, I read through it and I think uh, taking the hypotheticals out is a, is a good idea. Or, and just because I think the the discussion is is very thorough, and I mean, you basically go through the scenarios that you otherwise would have done in this in the the facts and the hypotheticals uh, really uh, pretty thoroughly. So I, I don't think the, the hypos would be needed uh, for this particular opinion. And as far as the other question, I can't think of a time when you would be able to recover more than quantum merit in the situation here. <clears throat> Thank you. I, and I'm, yeah, I'm really just wondering if anyone believes that the way it currently reads is uh, too prohibitive, that, they're, that we're somehow stepping on the attorney's legitimate rights to have these alternate fee arrangements um, and that we're being you know, too uptight about it. Because the more we've thought about it, the more we're thinking it's, you know, we can take this strident stand, that it's not that we're not coming up with scenarios that uh, where it's appropriate other than the scenario five and and our after we talked about it we're, we're we're just thinking those those circumstances might be just you know uniquely far-fetched um so let me take that let me take i'll play that um i'll play that hat uh, i i personally um really like the scenarios because they make you really think about well why is this kosher why is this definitely not kosher how could this be kosher um, and if we were to take those out and uh, which you know boy i'd be so sad because i know how much thought went into them i i would be left with feeling like um, i would want to know more as the reader about when these conversion clauses can be kosher because as you noted brandon i, I think that there there is kind of a stern approach taken that usually they're not enforceable and so i think just kind of from a um balanced pers balanced beam perspective it would be helpful uh, to punch up you know with or without the factual scenarios situations um that that a uh, conversion clause could be ethical Mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, maybe there are either other ethics opinions or cases out there that we could rely upon to show, you know, look, here's a scenario where, where conversion clause was permissible, um, so that there's something concrete that, uh, or more concrete, um, again, particularly if you don't have that fifth back pattern, um, for the reader to, to say, oh, you know what, it's not just, there, you can't do it in this, that, or the other scenario, but here are some situations where it is permissible, and here's why conversion clauses um, are not, you know, make sense, can be appropriate, and here are the contours um, for that. I, I think we'd want to take a, a look at the opinion in that in that framework, um, if especially if we, we lose the hypotheticals. And um, relatedly, you know, this it's a very interesting question, you know, uh, about quantum merit. Could it ever be? Um, permissible to, to receive more than quantum merit? Uh, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I, I, whenever I think about this opinion, I always go back to this, my own hypothetical about some super sophisticated, super wealthy uh, client who just wants that lawyer and says, right. listen, I don't want to pay you, but I want you. And I'm going to give you some great terms and I accept the risks and let's sign up, let's do it. And then the relationship falls out and the, this client, super sophisticated, super wealthy is left with what in other concept, contexts could be considered a draconian conversion clause. Well, is it really unethical in that fact pattern? And, and I always go back to that because it, it makes me think, well, geez, maybe, maybe there are situations, even if extreme, where they are permissible, but then what's, what's the range, what's the tolerance there? You know, what, what point, you know, in terms of sophistication or wealth of the client, 
um, you go down the rank, rung, is it is it not permissible? And so I think exploring that, if, if not in, in the scenarios, but in the text, would be something interesting to consider. And, and relatedly, maybe we want to look outside the conversion clause context to see if there are situations where lawyers can recover more than quantum merit. Um, I don't know what they would be or if they exist, but that might help shed light on um, this question and how we might uh, resolve it uh, in this in this opinion if we if we decide to address it. Yeah, Justin, I'm I'm a lot calmer now, but um, we did work in that direction in our discussions, and we came to the conclusion that you would have to come up with a really sophisticated, like a, a Cochet case, a real sophisticated client situation where it would have to be able to work out. And that's how we got to scenario number five. And the trouble with scenario number five, as we discussed it through, was that it still suffers from some of the same disincentives to um, settlement and hiring new counsel. But that's only looking at it from the, it only works if you look at it from this perspective of what happens if you lose attorney one, and now you got to get attorney number two. Well, then what happens if you lose attorney number two and you've got to get attorney number three? Those same dentist disincentives are now an attorney two's contract, which prevents you from getting attorney number three. So, um, or settling your case. So it just, I got in my own mind, I can't speak for the other two. I got in my mind real comfortable about just getting rid of the scenarios and leaving it to a cochette or somebody to come up with that and get a court to agree with them rather than us trying to opine on it as an ethical obligation and encourage somebody to go out and do something that might harm a client for the two reasons that Brandon pointed out. So that's where I came real comfortable with saying, let's just get rid of it. So, so for me, I do think... Um... The advantage to the scenarios is it shows some the application of our thinking, right? The first four, where we're talking about why those conversion clauses fail or are unacceptable, um, it's to my mind um, they're useful as a whole, just to the extent that they might dissuade attorneys from trying to tweak around what we're saying, right? To go around the edges of what we're saying. And it shows four examples of like, you're not gonna be able to accomplish that. You're not gonna be able to do an end run around what we're saying by, by tweaking some of the dynamics. Number five, I think I was a little bit more comfortable with number five than, than Joel was. Um, but I will say it's, it's so highly unusual, right? You've got an in-house counsel, you've got a, um, they're, they're talking uh, beforehand about the very scenario in which the burdens of the conversion clause could occur. It's all discussed in advance. It, it doesn't strike me as unethical under those circumstances. I don't want to encourage people to do it. I was kind of hoping that we've built so many um, unusual protections into that hypo that, that practitioners will look at it and say, well, you know, gosh, unless they actually do have in-house counsel, I don't want to be vulnerable to challenge on this. Um, and if there's in-house counsel, I'm much less concerned. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I do see an advantage to the hypos, um, but um, I guess my first, my threshold question is, are we generally comfortable with the pretty constrictive view of, of this opinion, that the circumstances under which conversion clauses may be acceptable are going to be pretty narrow and rare? Um, and, you know, because I want to make, I want to make sure we don't have a committee sentiment that no, no, these things are they, these things can generally be fine. I think you're overstating it. Maybe we start there and then decide what to do with that with the hypos. Does anybody have thoughts about that? Whether the uh, opinion is too restrictive in terms of its approach uh, regarding conversion clauses. Well, I, I'll just again, I won't repeat what I said, but um, 
I feel like it, it does present a restrict a restrictive approach and it and and I've tried to conceptualize the opinion without the hypotheticals. And and that's where I get into, well, I'd like to know more about um, you know, what what how, how would a conversion clause be structured not only to be ethically permissible, but also factor in protecting clients to the extent that they're gonna to agree to these things. Um, right. And we have some of that in there, but I, I think, you know, we'd wanna look at it with, a, with another gloss um, if we don't have the hypotheticals that flesh that out. <laughs> well, we, we couldn't think of one that, even five was really stretching it, but I mean, you know, in answer to your comments, Justin, I mean, you know, the case law is fairly clear that, you know, when you get into quantum merit, it can't exceed the contract price. So that's where we kept coming back with, you know, if you get a conversion clause that somehow gives you more than the contract, more than the quantum merit, um, that we, we just couldn't find a situation where that would apply. And the concept of the sophisticated client, you know, who just wants the lawyer, I mean, we kind of toyed around with that in, some of these in, in scenario five, but you know, ultimately, you know, uh, no matter how sophisticated the client is, I don't know that the lawyer can, or the client, I, I don't know, I guess the, 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 the concept that the client could waive these ethical obligations of the lawyer, I guess they, they can, but I don't know that that's something <laughs> We really want to address or suggest is in any way proper in an ethics opinion. It's, it's interesting. I think both, um, and, and I forgive me if I'm misstating Joel and Ken sort of, I think Joel and Ken were somewhat concerned that providing scenario five, where under these unique circumstances, the conversion clause is okay, um, might encourage the use of in conversion clauses. Whereas my thinking was it's so, um, stocked with unusual factors that maybe it would dissuade. So I'm, I'm just not sure, you know, um, where, where that one shakes out. Well, also the, the, the thing about scenario number five is that if this lawyer is so good that they're going to come in and save the day, they're going to get compensated under the uh, Kazari's case by the relative value of their contributions compared to this poor attorney number one who didn't do a good job. And still that if they fix that amount against a exact percentage, overall percentage of what the case is worth, now, now they can't, the attorney is stuck. I mean, the client is stuck right. with attorney two and can't go to attorney three. Well, our current scenario five is not because we had talked about scenarios um, tied to termination of attorney. The current scenario five is tied to a conversion clause that impacts the client's ability to determine settlement. And, and it's, it's a unique circumstance where, you know, a, a client is saying for cash flow reasons, I'd, I'd prefer not to pay you hourly, but I want to be honest with you. I have this great claim, but depending on how my business is going, I might walk away from the whole thing. And I don't want you to be totally, you know, out in the cold if I do that. So we'll agree that if I walk away from my claim, you can get your hourly fee, you know? So um, totally unique circumstances. And, and one in which I'm comfortable under those circumstances that it's not, you know, ethically prohibited. I'm not sure everyone feels that way. But to me, it was, you know, that's one of the rare ones I could come up with that seemed okay. Yeah, and, maybe it, and maybe it does show how hard it is to find one that is okay. And maybe that's illustrative for the reader. But then Brandon, as I think we brought up in our discussions, where I, I come up against the wall is that either way, you're hedging the compensation you're going to get of the contingency either happening or not happening yeah with a guarantee for a fee which is true you're, it's true you're really not taking the contingent risks that justify whatever the percentage is if it goes forward well that you make a really good point but there's one more nuance on that because if 
the client never chooses to walk away from this claim and you go to trial and lose, they really don't get a fee. So there is risk there, but you've taken away any risk that the client will settle settle in a way that harms your your entitlement to fees. So it's 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 even more nuanced, yeah. I'm I'm just wondering if that's still helpful to a reader or if I've created a hypo that's so bizarre. I've actually seen stuff like this a couple times. Um, so it's not impossible, but it's also I, I don't worry about it nearly as much if there's in-house counsel, you know, thinking this through and reviewing it. And also, well, you can get the same result by just having a uh, a mixed, uh, you know, an hour, a reduced hour hybrid and a yeah. contingent component. Could you? Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's thing. dumb. I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know. So well, and Justin, uh, talking about how other other states have, you know, I've there's this Colorado ethics opinion that I thought was the most well-developed of the opinions I've seen. And it's referenced in here a couple of times, but it appears to me, and I haven't separately researched it, that under Colorado law, where th there's not a default entitlement to quantum merit in the same sense that there is in California. So a lot of the conversion clauses in Colorado actually spell out the, that, well, if I'm not gonna get my contingent fee because the relationship ends, I get quantum merit. Um, which seems fine, right? You get a reasonable fee for the value of your reasonable work. Uh, and, and I mean, and again, I haven't confirmed that in Colorado that is true, but, but if indeed there, the, there's no default to quantum merit, they're going to have a whole bunch of conversion clause that in Colorado, if they default, if, if the conversion clause entitles you to quantum merit, then that's fine. It doesn't raise the same ethical issues here, where under the appropriate circumstances, you already have a right to quantum merit fees that protects the attorney. And the only purpose of a conversion clause would be to try to goose it up above that and run into trouble. So that's why it, you know, we're generally so restrictive here. No, that, that all makes sense. Um, what I what I'll think we should do, uh, because I'm only one of three uh, leadership uh, members, uh, I'd like to check in with Dina and Sarah and get their feedback. Um, Absolutely. For, for the for the uh, subcommittee about uh, whether or not to <clears throat> proceed with the hypotheticals and um, whether they think it is too restrictive uh, or if we should need to make any adjustments in that regard. Because um, I think those are the sort of gating questions to mm -hmm. kind of the next step in, in drafting. Um, at least in, from my perspective, Whichever way we go, I mean, I think we're you know one or two iterations away from from uh, public comment, so I think we're we're we're, we're getting there, and this is um, very well developed. So, Great. Um, my my inclination is get you the feedback from them, get a consensus there, and then hopefully for the next uh, meeting, we'll have a, a draft that we can really um, you know dig into, and either. Um, uh, then publish it for public comment or the next meeting, have it ready for, for public comment. If that, if that works for, for, you know, whatever your schedule ends up being in uh, uh, late spring, early summer. Sounds yeah. great. Justin, it would be great if you just give us whatever feedback you get, give us some guidance, and then we can address whatever comes up out of your conversation and be that much further ahead at the next meeting. Yeah. So um, why don't we do it this way? I'll, I'll, I'll confer with, Dina and Sarah, and then um, once we're on the same page, I'll shoot you guys an email. Um, so your subcommittee, it's Brandon, Joel, and um, Ken, is that right? Yes. So that you're all, you all have the benefit of um, you know, our, our, our thoughts, and then you can kind of run with it, and then we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll plan to have a, a, a substantive conversation uh, to the extent we need to. Um, and then, you know, like I said, one or two more rounds and, and I think we're ready for public comment. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Justin, could I ask a quick question of Joel and Ken? I have a quick question though. My, my internet kicked out and I just kicked back in and heard Brandon say thank you. <laughs> so I, I missed. We, we got a word of opinion of the year. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, but well, Randall, you can ask me a question. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, fee arbitrator advisories, they're different from the, the ethics opinions, because I know the ethics opinions typically include, you know, at least one hype of ethical fact pattern, if not more than one. But I know that the fee arbitration advisory sometimes, um, you know, they don't rely on a, uh, on a hypothetical fact pattern in order to issue the training and guidance. And I'm just wondering, have you encountered any issues in using those as education and training devices merely because they don't have a hypothetical fact pattern or, or do they work just fine? Well, typically those advisories have addressed a single issue. Um, where you really don't need a lot of hypotheticals, but we have used hypotheticals in some of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but we thought this one, if we're gonna look at what are the ethical ramifications as opposed to the fee arbitration ramifications, um, the hypotheticals just weren't working so well because um, what we tell people in the advisory is that that's on, it's unconscionable to have those kinds of provisions in your contract. So go figure out the, the reasonable value of everybody. But I think that doesn't answer the, whether there's an ethical ramification to it, which is what we tried to address here. Okay. I don't know if Ken has any other thoughts on that. No, no, I think that's some that uh... Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, I, I really like hypotheticals, so um, I'll be very curious to see Dina, you know, hear what Dina and uh, Sarah's reaction is. Um, I understand why for this particular opinion, there's um, an inclination to omit them, but um, I think just getting the, the group's uh, collective thoughts will be helpful. So um, once I hear from them, I'll let you know what they think. Yeah, and I, I appreciate it. You know, we one of our thoughts was with these four, the first four where we just say, no, 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 no. Um, is that really adding value? But talking about it today, I'm wondering to, to see what you guys think, whether it adds value just in the explanation of why we're saying no. Um, so we look, we very much look forward to these, the feedback. Thanks. Is that what the feedback is going to be, whether to do the hypotheticals or not, or and generally the, on whether whether the the thrust of the opinion being as restrictive uh -huh. um, strikes them as accurate as as proper as well. Okay. All right. Thanks. So I think in the limited time we have left, I don't, I, I don't. Sorry, Ken. I don't think we're going to get to twenty triple oh three. Um, but what I'd like to do are two things. One is sort of a check in on the ethics symposium. And here, uh, where where the moderators are, and what if anything they need from um, either staff or um, me, Dina, and Sarah in terms of helping. And then, <coughs> Cassidy, if you feel up to it, to just give a general synopsis of the in-house counsel outline um, and anything um, we can do to help um, uh, in, in that in any any other issue outlines that folks want to discuss. We can close with that. Um, so in terms of the ethics symposium, um, and I would invite if Mimi and Randall, if you have anything in terms of deadlines that you wanna mention about the symposium, feel free to chime in. Um, so uh, Sarah, Dina and I have um, touched base about the uh, opinions or uh, ethics issues that we're gonna talk about in our um, panel. It's gonna be very similar to what we did last year except with new opinions and new issues, um, we'll have more specificity uh, in terms of which specific ones that is, uh, you know, before April, I promise. But that, but not want to take any more of your time. I'll just let you know that's in progress and um, it'll be a very similar format and style um, to what we did last year for the, for the leadership panel. Um, uh, Ken, Brandon, um, I know Hunter's not with us, but um, can you give us just sort of a brief update of where you are with um, your panels and if there's anything that um, you have questions um, about or anything or any help that you need? So I'll just jump in real quick. Mine started out as entry into the practice of law and it's expanding a little bit to talk about barriers to entry. Um, and I have two panelists so far, Carol Buckner and Aaron Joyce. Um, who are 
really interesting speakers with great perspectives on a variety of issues, including, you know, Carol has been um, the dean of a couple of law schools, has uh, was the dean of an online law school that was started out being unaccredited and became accredited and was subject to a lot of criticism for being online, which became ironic over the past couple of years when all law schools were online. Um, and yeah, she's got a lot of interesting thoughts about that. Um, Aaron talks, uh, has an interesting perspective on the, um, a couple things, the moral character evaluations and how those are handled um, and on the level of uh, ethical awareness and education that new members of the bar are getting and ways in which um, new members of the bar sort of get, uh, find themselves in trouble. And she had some really interesting stories to tell about um, they come under the sway of, uh, of disbarred attorneys actually, who are just using these new members for their licenses, uh, manipulating them and taking them down, you know, uh, bad, bad avenues. And, and we're considering talking about the paraprofessional rules, implications of that whole area as well. And so I'm trying to decide uh, if I want to find a third panelist who is, um, is just knowledgeable about the rules or is uh, very much in favor of the paraprofessional rules because in the ethical community, there's, it's easy to find critics, uh, a little harder to find strong advocates. And Aaron Joyce is a very outspoken critic. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about balancing that out with the third, third person. But um, hopefully I'll have better focus in the next week or two on, on topics and have a third panelist. Well, it sounds like you have a, a really good focus and um, you have definitely spiced up that, that subject matter. That sounds like it's gonna be a great panel and uh, I love where you're going with it. Good, good, okay. Ken, do you have any uh, th updates for us? Any, any questions or help you need? Uh, updates, I've got my third panelist, Lorraine Walsh. She was a former chair of the Fee Arbitration Committee. Um, my internet kicked out again when you were talking, Justin, so I didn't catch which opinions you guys are gonna be covering. Is the flat fee something you guys are gonna be addressing or? We have not decided which opinions, but we will coordinate with you to avoid talking about opinions that might um, encompass your subject matter of your panel. So we'll, we'll interface with you, Hunter and Brandon about that. Let's make sure we don't overlap. It looks like Ken froze. I froze. <laughs> um, Mimi, I don't know, did Hunter um, relay anything to you yes. about your panel? He has, um, let's see, hold on, where'd it go? Um, so it turns out Hunter has secured one person for sure, Terrence. Let me see, hold on. That's that's my Terrence. Okay, more yeah, which, which was a referral from you. And then the other person is Professor Crayville from. Can you hear uh, me now? Oh, yep. You're back. Okay, I'll let Ken finish first and then I'll give you the update on Hunter. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes. And now we've got the general fee topics that you know we've uh, that uh, Joel had lined in the uh, memo he sent to Mimi before, but I need to set up a meeting now with Lorraine and uh, Joel to kind of nail that down where we want to go with these. So it's you, Lorraine Walsh, Joel, and is is there anyone else, or is it the three of you? Uh, right now, that's what I had. I don't know if we needed another one. Um, You're not required to have four. Three works for you, and you have sufficient expertise. You guys should be okay. Yeah, I haven't had to get a fourth one yet. If anybody, you know, I, I'm good with the three we have. If there's any suggestions anybody might have on somebody who would be good where we're with that. All right. Th thanks, Ken. Um, so, uh, Mimi, um, where's, uh, you said Terrence and Professor Crayville for Hunter? Yes, she was, uh, I believe Hunter was waiting to hear back from leadership. I don't know why, but I guess he had run that idea by you. 
or by leadership um, asking if that would be okay to add this speaker. Um, uh, Janine Craybill is pre-law program director at Cal State University Bakersfield and has done research on implicit bias regarding gender and judicial officers. So she, um, from the research I've done on her, she uses qualitative and quantitative analysis in order to assess differences between male and female judges. So the way um, she did a huge survey on the way that women as, verse, as opposed to men who are on the bench may um, uh, interact with the clients that come into their courtroom in like domestic violence issues or family, uh, family law type cases. And so he thought that she might be a good addition since she's actually studied um, you know, implicit bias within the courtroom. And so I think he wanted to see if leadership was okay with that. And then he's still looking for a third member for his, uh, for a third person. If anybody has any suggestions, um, please email them to Hunter and he'd really appreciate it. Okay, I remember he sent an email. I, I did not register it as looking for our permission, but I will um, make sure we circle back with him about um, Professor okay. Craybill. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, and any any comments uh, or anything you want to mention, either Mimi or Randall, about the symposium? Or well, I did want to mention the deadline to submit names of panelists. Um, panel titles and descriptions is actually February twenty first. I'm thinking you guys are still working on it. Maybe I I could extend that to Friday the twenty fifth, if that would help you guys out. There really is no rush to get it up, except for that we do want to send out the save the date um, so people can start, you know, planning to attend. Um, the official brochure um, and e-blast, we're going to go at, we're, we're, we're going to go out the following Monday, but we can push that for a few days. So if I get it in all your information by Friday, we should be good to start marketing it the following Friday. So that would be March 4th. That would give people roughly a month to register. That's great. And so I'm thinking maybe we should plan to set up a um, moderators and speakers call. And it doesn't need to be all the speakers, just if you're on Coprac, maybe you can join. I mean, you know, and we can set up a, a one talk about time slots because I think. Brandon needed the second time slot because uh, of one of his speakers has a conflict, yes. right, Brandon? Yes. And then it's kind of up in the air, I guess, based on, you know, speakers availability, especially if you're bringing in an outside expert that you absolutely need on your panel and has a time restriction, then we could juggle the different panels based on um, any demand. Sorry, mine was, I don't know what's going <laughs> on the internet. I, I heard something about the 25th, but I don't know what that was. So I'm giving, I'm changing the deadline to submit panel names, descriptions, panel descriptions for the brochure and uh, panel titles. I'm extending that deadline to next Friday, but I need it by next Friday so we can get the marketing materials out, the brochures, set up the registration page or whatnot. But I think if you guys are available, I'd like to set up just a status call with all the moderators late next week, maybe Wednesday or Thursday, if you guys need assistance coming up with a catchy name or, you know, hopefully you will have secured your speakers at least by then. Yeah, sounds good. If you want to um, send an email out to, uh, to um, I guess, leadership and the panelists, uh, moderators, excuse me, and then we'll find a either Wednesday, Thursday uh, date to connect. That's what I'm thinking. So I'll send out a doodle poll um, and just polling everyone's availability to just meet. It should probably be maybe like 30 to 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how deep in the rabbit hole we get, I guess. But um, I think that would probably be a safe bet is to just at least have that status meeting and see where everybody is in regards to knowing, for example, like even your panel and the fees panel, are you guys gonna overlap on certain things or what, what's off limits because we're totally handling it, that kind of discussion. Perfect. Okay, so right now I'm available next week, but I'm on cover duty for one lawyer whose wife is expecting any day and another one who might have to go out of town. So while my calendar is currently clear, I might wind up having depots to, uh, Tuesday through Friday. So okay. lucky what fun. you. What fun. Well, yeah. lucky for you, you can always have Joel step in for you as well. 
<laughs> the great thing yeah. about having another panelist <laughs> who's uh, on the committee. So if you can't make it, then Joel can always just fill you in on what was discussed. Okay. Okay. I thought you meant Joel to cover his deposition. But I would, <laughs> hearing about, hearing I would about prefer that. that. <laughs> so uh, we, we've only got 15 minutes um, and we've had, we've covered a lot today. I think uh, it's probably not going to be very productive to start and stop something. Um, but um, I do want to just take a few minutes. I know that we have uh, some issue outlines that folks are working on, including the in-house counsel outline. And, and Cassidy, I don't know that we have time to go through this, but um, could you remind us who is on this um, sub subcommittee with you working on the uh, in-house counsel? Sure, it's uh, Sarah and Dina. Sarah and Dina. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, does any, I think there's room for one one more person who could uh, join that subcommittee. Is there anyone who's interested in the in-house counsel topic that would like to join that subgroup? Well, if you uh, if you change your mind or become interested, um, let me know. Let uh, me know. I, I, I'm interested, but my plate's kind of full right now. I got a trial in April and a trial in July. And I'm working on the flat fee and the contingency one. So Understood. I want to commit to something I can't fulfill, but no, no problem. Um, <clears throat> there's also with the, the cryptocurrency out, it, issue outline, I, I suspect there'll be some developments there. Right now, that's Bill and Eleanor, and, and I'm helping as well. I think that has room for uh, one more person. So if anyone um, becomes interested in that, let me, and let me know. And um, and uh, would love to slot another person in and, and continue to have that one develop as well. Are, are there any other? Uh, and I, I don't have the, the list in front of me, but is, are there any other um, issue outlines um, that anyone who's still on the call or is working on who thinks would benefit from having additional uh, support? Well, I think Kyla's. Um, opinion as attorney and advocate, and she doesn't quite have a, um, she's, I don't know, that one's kind of still up in the air. We really haven't done much work on it because, you know, right. she hasn't been available. I don't know. We're kind of in the, maybe we just let her work on it and then decide once she's done yeah. an initial um, issue outline to see if it's even worth pursuing. Who knows? So maybe we can hold off on that. Otherwise, all the other opinions are pretty good, except for illegal contract provisions. It's Sarah and just Dina as an advisor. I don't know if we really need to add someone considering it just came back from public comment, but if it looks like it needs some work, maybe we could add at least one for them to bounce, off, bounce some ideas off of. Yeah, I'll ask them when I reach out about the uh, conversion clause opinion. Um, at the very least, we'll, we'll highlight for our next meeting that that is um, the illegal contract opinion is one that we'll really want folks to dig into beforehand. Um, and have a real, a real substantive conversation about. But again, for in-house counsel and cryptocurrency, uh, it would be great to add one more person to each of those um, working groups. So please um, check your calendars, check your interests. And if, if you uh, would like to take it on, let me, let me know. And, and um, go ahead. What I can do is when I send out the assignments <laughs> next in my email, I'll also solicit any, any volunteers because a lot of our members aren't on this call right now. There might be someone who would be um, excited to join. For sure. All right. Well, for the five or six of us that are remaining here, uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Can I just make one comment because I've been bouncing in and out here. If, if people have a chance to the question about informed consent you know, going above and beyond what uh, what uh, Rule 1.5 provided and the issue about amending uh, midstream modification. Oh, jeez, I, <laughs> I don't know if you can still, oh, there you are. Okay, yeah, people can keep your thoughts. All right, I, I appreciate Ken <laughs> trying to communicate with us. I, I feel... I feel bad, but I'll shoot Ken um, an email and I'll ask him yeah. what he wanted to be asked, and I can send out a Perfect. message to the entire committee <laughs> trying to convey what his message was or what his ask was. <laughs> Very good. Well, on that high note, um, 
I hope you all have a nice weekend and uh, I think we can conclude. You too. Have a good weekend, everyone.